Good afternoon, we are live in council chamber. Before we begin, I'll go over the emergency response plan for this room. In an emergency, everyone must evacuate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery take direction from security to evacuate. Council takes direction from the meeting clerk to evacuate. After evacuating the room, please proceed to the nearest building exit and go to a master point. Do not take an elevator or walk through the city room. Anyone with limited mobility should identify themselves to security or the meeting clerk during an evacuation. Finally, please speak with security or the meeting clerk if you require first aid. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order and begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, at this time, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. Uh, and I will start with a roll call. Uh, Councillor Wright? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Principe. Hello. Hi. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Hello. Uh, Councillor Tang. Okay. Uh, and Marisohi will be joining us later. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hello. Um, I am here. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor uh, Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, excellent. Uh, so <clears throat> adoption of the agenda. Uh, can I get a motion for that? Councillor Rutherford, would you like to do that? So I, the adoption of the agenda, would like to move that the March 5th, 2024 City Council non-regular meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of 5.1, Accessibility Advisory Committee 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan. 5.2, Community Services Advisory Board 2023 Annual, work, Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan. 5.3, Edmonton Design Committee. 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, 5.4 Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, 5.5 Naming Committee, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, 5.6 Edmonton Historical Board, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, 5.7 Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton Committee, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, 5.8 Edmonton Combative Supports Commission, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, published February 26th, and uh, 5.9 Edmonton, Tra Edmonton Transit Services Advisory Board, 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan, published March 1st. Second. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, please vote for the option of the agenda. Councillor Stevenson is a yes. Councillor Principe is a yes. Yes, Madam Clerk. Yes. 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 Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Great, so we'll move on to selection of items for debate. I'll look to the board. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I would like to select 5.9 and 5.7, please. Okay, sorry, that was 5.9 and 5.7. Councillor Wright. 5.1 and 5.2, please. 5.1, 5.2, Councillor Knack. 
I was just going to select the rest. Whatever, whatever others didn't want to select. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Councillor Knack has selected the remaining items, which means we have selected uh, all of the items for debate. So, um, we do not need to vote on reports not selected for debate. Uh, request to speak, none. Request for time specific on the agenda, we have none. Uh, vote on bylaws not selected for debate, also none. Um, so, uh, reports to be dealt with at a different meeting, none. Uh, no request to reschedule reports, which means we're moving into our public reports. Uh, and first up on the agenda is the Accessibility Advisory Committee 2023 Annual Report and 2024 Work Plan. Um, so I will pass it over to administration. I know we have a delegation from the committee as well. Would you like us to provide opening remarks? That would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, so good afternoon, Council. At today's City Council meeting, we will be receiving annual reports from the following Council committees. Accessibility Advisory Committee, Community Services Advisory Board, Edmonton Design Committee, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee, Naming Committee, Edmonton Historical Board, and the Co-Historian Laureates, Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton Committee, Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board, and Edmonton Combative Sports Commission. To note, it is anticipated Council will receive the annual reports for the City of Edmonton Youth Council and Edmonton Salutes Committee at the May 14th City Council meeting. For each Council committee, either the committee chair, co-chairs, and or vice chair will be attending virtually. A representative from administration is also available virtually for each council committee should council have questions for administration. Myself, Molly Everett, Nancy Jacobson, and Judy Bonner are in attendance from the Office of the City Clerk. As a reminder, Bylaw 18156, Council Committee's bylaw, includes the following requirements for annual reports and work plans. At least annually, all committees will report to council. A council committee must approve a work plan that aligns with council's strategic objectives and the council committee's mandates. This includes a reporting of what resources were provided in the previous year and the anticipated resource requirements for the upcoming year. During its annual report to council, a council committee must present the work plan as well as a summary of the status of the previous year's work plan. In line with these requirements, each of today's reports has three attachments. Attachment one is the 2023 annual report. Attachment two is the resource information for 2023 and 2024. Attachment three will be the 2024 work plan. Templates were provided to council committees. The templates are a part of admi the administrative response to the civic agency's governance audit, recommendation three, which is to provide city council with reporting requirements for advisory committees and decision-making boards to report enough information for council to assess progress against their mandates. If council committees opted not to use the templates, they were asked to provide the same information requested in the templates. I would be happy to review the requested content for each template should council like this information. For advisory committees, the reports include a recommendation to approve subcommittees for the 2024 work plan. As a reminder, in accordance with bylaw 18156, if approved to do so by council, advisory committees may establish subcommittees to conduct research, obtain and summarize public input, or to obtain specialized expertise and provide reports on those matters to the council committee. Advisory committees have submitted requests for subcommittees as part of the work plans. Advisory committees have provided rationale supporting their requests in the work plan, including membership of the subcommittees. The council report also includes information on whether admin is supportive of the request for subcommittees and confirmation that they do or do not have the resources to support the subcommittee. As a reminder, subcommittees established by council committees must follow the meeting procedures prescribed by the MGA and the Council Procedures Bylaw. Lastly, the report for Edmonton Combative Sports Commission and the naming committee are, uh, the recommendations are to be received for information. I will pause here and happy to answer any questions. Great, well thank you so much for uh, the overview. Uh, are there any questions from colleagues before we get started? Seeing none, uh, I think we can now um, invite the chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee, uh, Tanya LaRiviere, uh, to provide some uh, remarks. Do you have a presentation, Tanya? No. Okay. Uh, well, we will turn it over to you for a bit of an overview and um, see if any colleagues have some questions for you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tanya LaRiviere and I chair the Accessibility Advisory Committee. It's a pleasure to be here. 
Uh, an overview, 2023 in review, we, review, we welcomed two new members to the committee. Dana and Taya Moore moved into the position of policy subcommittee chair, and Zachary Weeks took on the role of community engagement subcommittee chair. We had guest presenters attend our general meetings almost monthly. We met regularly with Vehicle for Hire on updates to driver accessibility training and continued to provide additional feedback. We also received regular updates on policy C602, corporate accessibility plan, Affordable housing section presented on affordable and uh, accessible housing. We received a presentation on the city's rapid housing initiative. And members of our committee prepared a mental health and addictions as disability presentation. We had a strategic planning session that identified our priority areas as snow and ice control, accessible and reliable transportation, and accessible and affordable housing. But I'll speak more on that in the 2024 work plan. Various members attended conferences, educational and community events, including treat accessibility. Members represented the committee for online and in-person events and accessibility consultations, including testing a prototype for temporary ramps, LRT Valley Line West low floor car testing, CNIB public forum journey mapping, and vehicle for hire driver training persona development. Social media, we increased our social media engagement and used those social media channels to amplify and support community events, International Day of Persons with Disabilities and National Accessibility Week, Awareness Week. Um, we developed a promotional video in conjunction with National Accessibility Awareness Week and learned of community concerns and brought them forward to city admin with Resolve and developed an accessible parking awareness campaign. We spoke to council on snow and ice control assisted snow and ice programs and the zoning bylaw renewal. I thought we were more focused on working items that aligned with council priorities. Having representatives, Councillor Tang and Council Wright contributes a great deal to staying steady in that alignment. Our 2024 work plan, we benefited from the strategic planning and facilitation services of Pam Panitka. She was previously the communications director with the city supporting urban form and corporate strategic development, now called urban planning and economy. So she has a solid understanding of how city admin and council work and the role of the committee. She's a fantastic group facilitator and we benefited from the facilitation process. Our, girls, our goals for 2024 as they align to council priorities include transportation, affordable and accessible, including ETS buses, LRT, DATS, on demand, vehicle for hire, taxis, and rideshare. We will continue to receive a minimum two updates a year from vehicle for hire. Accessible and affordable housing. The AAC will continue to advise and encourage city council to be a municipal leader and leverage that leadership to promote accessible housing through zoning, tax grants, resources, education, legislation, breakdown barriers, new ideas, and understandings. Needless to say, we are thrilled to hear the Government of Canada has allotted $175 million to the City of Edmonton to develop and eliminate barriers to affordable housing. It is our priority to ensure that they are built accessible, and there is accessibility representation on the Mayor's Task Force. This will be a priority for the committee. Snow and Ice Control. We will continue to contribute to and engage with Admin and City Council on best approaches to snow and ice control measures assisted snow removal initiatives, contribute to or share community awareness campaigns, education and responsibilities, policy C602 corporate actions. The AAC will continue to work with admin and have regularly scheduled presentations, updates and engagement around the implementation of policy C602. We wanna commend them on the work being done and thank them for the regular updates and you know, opportunities for input. Community engagement, the community engagement subcommittee plans to connect with at least four groups a year. We ideally are thinking up to eight to come and present on the operations of their organization and concerns of the demographic they represent. This will help build our knowledge base and solidify partnerships and community. We plan to send quarterly email newsletters to our contact list, develop two social media campaigns, one around accessible parking, promote events relevant to the community. And we would like to continue to develop and approve a monthly social media themed calendar implemented through a third party vendor. Resources, we're not asking for any additional resources. 
In 2023, we used a third-party vendor to manage our social media platforms on Facebook and X, and we have seen an increase in engagement on Facebook. I'd like to emphasize the importance of BAAC having a social media platform. It is an important communications tool as it allows for accessible two-way communication. We learn of accessibility concerns from the community, and we have brought them forward and admin has addressed them. It allows us to share the work of the committee and city in direct and accessible manner. The ability to use Instagram will be very positive for our social media presence. We would like to see this resource continue and feel it's unreasonable to ask a member of the committee to volunteer to fulfill this role, taking into consideration time, consistency, tone, training, and turnover. It also lacks the potential for, for public-facing awareness, growth, transparency, and engagement. Our current meeting structure includes a main meeting and two subcommittee meetings, policy and community engagement. Both of these committees are working committees. There currently is not enough time in the main meeting to address all the items addressed at the subcommittee meetings and working committees would be working committees would be required. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much for that presentation and overview. Um, I'll now, now look to the board for questions and uh, I might start with Councillor Wright uh, as you selected this. Thank you very much, Councillor Salvador. Um, Tonya, uh, thank you and, and for the committee for, um, I guess, providing such a great perspective, not only um, to my, myself and, and Councillor Tang as, as advisors, but I think to, to all of Council and, and all of all Edmontonians, um, providing that perspective that we might not otherwise have. So I, I, I just do have a few questions. Um, as far as the, the third party vendor for the social media, um, I think in your work plan, you've indicated you didn't have it budgeted last year, but you found it beneficial that now you want to allocate that 750. Is that what that's for? The advertising publicity? Yes. Yeah. And that's, that, yeah. We feel like that's a really important component of the work we do just for transparency, accountability, and trust that we're representing the disability community with integrity and, and determination. Okay. Otherwise, there wouldn't be that venue. Okay. And then do you also like gather feedback um, through that social media as well from, from broader Edmontonians, not just the committee? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Excellent. And then um, community engagement. Um, I see your 2023 actuals were, were down what you had budgeted for, um, but you still anticipate that you're going to be needing those funds this coming year? It, are you expanding or...? Pardon for what? So under community engagement, you were you budgeted for twenty thousand, and twenty twenty three's actuals was just under seventy five hundred. Uh, that that would be for the social media. Oh, that's not the advertising publicity. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. a really important part of the. That would be the main budget. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that community oh. engagement line isn't for. Um, like for attending events or at cost of no that would be pardon me yet that would be for the social media okay okay so you're going to be expanding then still needing the twenty thousand. you think ideally yeah, yeah. Okay. i think we could work our social media platforms i think we can look at them to see what's working a little how we can improve okay um and and, you know, maybe that means not having X as a social media platform, um, but Instagram, I mean, we'll look at that and figure out the best approach. Where, where you're getting the, the best That's contact true. with people. Okay, awesome. Um, I don't think, oh, and your subcommittees then, um, yeah, they have been approved or um, administration doesn't feel that there's... Um, that they, that they have the resources to um, continue providing that that guidance, I guess, with the meetings and that, right? Yes, and we do immensely appreciate that support. Like that is huge for any of these committees, I'm sure, just for that consistency and that um, alignment piece. Um, so yes, as far as we're aware, <laughs> they haven't said okay. No more. Well, yeah, it, it says in the report that they're good to go with it. And do they provide that support um, 
uh, for um, for streaming the subcommittee meetings? Those are done in public as well. Uh, the like the online that's through admin. Yeah, but and that's for the subcommittees as well, not just the the committee of the the whole committee, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to check on that. Um, again, I have no other questions. I think yeah, what what you and and the whole committee does is is remarkable. So thank you very much for providing that perspective to to us. Thank you for listening to our voice and responding. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you so much for this. When I read the report, I was in awe of how much has been done by this committee over the course of 2023. So very impressive work. A few questions that I have. One thing that I flagged is around the policy subcommittee. I, I wanted to flag that there is an audit coming back this year in 2024, specifically related to um, inclusion and accessibility for programs within the recreation services. And I didn't see that anywhere on your radar. So I just wanted to, to flag that and ask if you had that on your radar. I'm sorry, could you, sorry, could you repeat that? So the city auditor is in their work plan and what's coming back in 2024 is an audit on recreation inclusion. So what kind of programs and services does the city have in place to make sure that recreation facilities and programs are inclusive and what needs to be done to improve. And I just, I didn't see that in your work plan for the policy subcommittee and I wanted to flag it for, for, for you. Cause I know usually you do with admin, but I think this is a really important one. Um, yeah. I, I would be definitely eager to hear from the accessibility advisory committee on their thoughts when that audit is released. Absolutely. And thank you so much for doing that and recreation. Um, is something that we've discussed. Um, it was in our facilitation process, but we will definitely add that as a priority because I completely agree. Yeah, okay, perfect. That's one thing I wanted to flag. And then the second one, can you elaborate more on uh, with around the housing affordability and the, the task force, uh, what, what, you, what kind of time, effort, energy you, you foresee the, the committee putting into that? Um, well, to be honest, I'm not too sure, but, um, obviously we want to ensure that, and maybe it's not like our committee specific, Yeah, uh, that is the main voice on it, but we want to ensure that there is that accessibility perspective. Um, we of course will do what we can, mm -hmm. um, with the resources that we do have, but it might just be that we're not actually the, the best voice for the work that needs to be done. Do you know what I mean? Like we yeah. do, obviously we want to be a voice and we want to participate, but is there, is there a better, is there a, a stronger option? Yeah. We just want to ensure that the accessibility voice is a part of that. Okay. But you have accessible housing in your work plan yes so do you see what kind of i see the task force on housing um zoning barrier free alberta i'm not sure what the premier's what's the premier's council on people with disabilities do you sit on that uh, no we don't but we have had meetings with them and discuss uh like collaborative discussions with them okay which was okay no this is this is very comprehensive. Um, I guess one last kind of thought provoking question I have is that probably one of the biggest critiques we get as a city, I would suggest that comes into my inbox around snow clearing is how it, it really makes it inaccessible for, for many folks that have any kind of mobility issue. Like our, our graders are, you know, creating windrows. They're maybe not clearing the, um, bus stops in a timely manner, those kind of things. Uh, what kind of work do you foresee in 2024 around snow clearing uh, 
that could help improve that situation and really make a difference in that because I feel like we've had a lot of conversations on snow clearing but that's one of the biggest critiques I would say that still exists in the snow and ice file around accessibility. Uh, yes, and thank you for being a constant on 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 this issue. Um, we really appreciate that. I think um, a really strong educational campaign um, would be beneficial uh, to let neighbors and community members and businesses know of their responsibility uh, to, for snow clearing, um, options for assistance, uh, what the realities are for somebody who, you know, has a stroller, you know, low vision or blind, wheelchair, what the realities are of snow and ice uh, for them in terms of mobility and independence. And of course, we would love to see an assisted snow removal program from the city, but one that is going to be effective. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Um, and uh, I do see Councillor Wright on the board. Are you on for questions, Councillor Wright, or were you looking to move the recommendation? I might just follow up on that line of questioning, and then I, I would also like to, sure, to move the recommendation. Move the second round. Um, can I get a motion to? Yeah, I'll move round? the second round. Second. Second. Please vote on a second round. Councillor Stevenson is a yes. Councillor Prince Bay is a yes. Councillor Rice, yes. The vote uh, will just be up in one moment if it's not appearing on your screens yet. And apologies, Councillor. Principe, uh, if you already indicated, if you could just confirm uh, your vote, please. Thank you. I am a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Councillor Wright. Thank you. So, so Tanya, um, is it a matter? <clears throat> sorry, is it a matter of the city? <clears throat> itself having the resources to go out and clear those bus stops and, and, and pathways along the way to those bus stops? Or do you feel that maybe more communication um, to residents about, and not just their responsibilities, but I, I think there's a lot of caring and co compassionate people in the city um, that could maybe like a, a, adopt a stop or something like that. Um, I doubt what would be more effective for the for the city to find the resources to pay to have the stops cleared or just to create a greater awareness? I think both are valuable. I would probably prioritize the city clearing. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to, to get your take on that. Um, I had an instance actually just the past couple of days of a, of a gentleman uh, not being able to, to get to the bus stop because the, the sidewalk was cleared, the, the entrance to the shelter was cleared at the, at the front of the street, but there was no pathway to get from the sidewalk to the front of the shelter. So I'm just wondering if, if maybe um, those things could be somehow flagged as, as being high priority ones that ones that people use frequently? Yeah, and that's one of the things that would be, well, that I thought about would be uh, considered in the educational plan and also the same with businesses. So through the parking lot, make sure there, there is that, that accessible path, but also training for the snow removal companies so that they are aware of accessibility needs just by piling up uh, a windrow along the, the side might block somebody's access. And in the ramps, okay. accessible ramps. Okay, awesome. Okay, thank you very much. I am gonna go ahead and uh, move, uh, move the motion that the Accessibility Advisory Committee's request to establish two subcommittees for the 2024 work plan as included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02273 be approved. Second. 
Great. Uh, we have a motion on the floor from Councillor Wright. Um, anyone to speak? If I can just continue to say that uh, the work of the Accessibility Advisory Committee is is uh, appreciated um, by not only council, but I think the city as a whole, providing that perspective um, of, of accessibility to uh, make Edmonton a more inclusive place for all. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much, Councillor Wright. Uh, please vote. Councillor Prince is a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya, um, for your for your ongoing contribution and, and for being with us today. Thank you. So we will now move to uh, 5.2, the Community Services Advisory Board. Uh, and I believe we have uh, Jenny Albers with us. Hi, Jenny. Hi there. Great. So we'll uh, turn the floor over to you for your presentation. Perfect. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you so much, City Council, for listing uh, for an overview of CSAB today. Um, so my name is Jenny Albers, and I'm the chair of the Community Services Advisory Board, uh, other known as CSAB. And I'm excited to provide an overview of all the work uh, from last year with CSAB, along with our upcoming work plan for this year. Next slide, please. Uh, so the mandate of the Community Services Advisory Board is to provide advice regarding grant funding allocations and have a key role in developing a long-term plan for community services in the City of Edmonton. So CSAB is comprised of 13 board members, and last year we welcomed five new board members to the team. As well, we have two subcommittees to support specific grant funding programs, so including the Family, Community and Support Services, or FCSS subcommittee, and the Community Investment Operating Grant, or the CIOG subcommittee. Next slide, please. Uh, so looking back into 2023, CSAB completed some great accomplishments to support community services in Edmonton. Uh, so we look back at our work plan from 2023. We had six main priority areas to lead the work for the year, and we'd like to share a few highlights. Uh, so the first two priorities aligned with city council priorities, so affordable housing um, and community safety and well-being. So the board heard from presentations from administration while engaging and providing feedback on future strategies. Uh, the next priority was the public spaces bylaw review as it impacted community services in Edmonton. The board learned about the bylaw review while providing feedback as part of the initial public engagement process. Um, as well, we did have a uh, recent turnover of board members. So the board initiated intentional board member learning opportunities to increase board relations and understanding of CSAP. As mentioned, the board also supports work with two subcommittees. So the Family and Community Support Services Subcommittee uh, had an immense amount of work and did a great job. Um, and it was driven by the committee to support over 100 programs, projects, and strong sector initiatives. Um, I will make a note uh, that additional information about the results of last year's FCSS funded programs and their outcomes will be provided in a separate Edmonton FCSS report to council later this spring. And then the Community Investment and Operating Grant Subcommittee. Um, so we did have the reinstatement of CIOG as part of the 2023 to 2026 budget adjustments, and the committee reviewed the program's formula and adjusted the program focus uh, to provide funding support to small and medium-sized community organizations that primarily serve Edmontonians. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so looking into 2024, the board has outlined four main goals for this year. So priority one and two align with the continuation of work from last year to focus on two council priorities. So affordable housing and homelessness and community safety and well-being. The board is looking forward to connecting with administration to continue the focus on these priorities. Uh, priority three is the community investment and operating grant. Uh, so it'll include reviewing and clarifying social service organization eligibility requirements for implementation in 2025. Previously, this work was completed by a subcommittee, but we will now absorb that work uh, fully by the board. And then priority four is family and community support services program. Um, and we are requesting a subcommittee to request this goal and work. 
Uh, so the subcommittee will provide advice to CSAB about the allocation of funds as, requ as required under the FCSS legislation, support the monitoring and evaluation of the program, and provide advice and knowledge of the social environment in Edmonton as required. Uh, it, if you might not know, an FCSS subcommittee has existed for the past 18 years of the Community Services Advisory Board and will ensure ongoing support for the substantial workload of the FCSS program. And then the other piece included in our work plan was around budget and resource allocation. Uh, so first off, we'd like to thank uh, the Community Services Department for their ongoing administration and support to the board. And we're excited to continue working with them uh, with our current service level. Uh, for the budget, uh, we are looking to allocate some of our existing funds to volunteer and recognition events to celebrate the successes specifically of our FCSS subcommittee, um, while also providing opportunities to connect with funders in the community and develop more of those relationships. And then next slide, please. Um, so as we wrap up, just a big thank you as well to Council Wright for her leadership and dedication and continuous support um, to supporting CSAB and the priorities. Uh, we are looking forward to 2024 and continuing to provide advice on long-term planning for community services in Edmonton. Um, so open to any questions you might have. Um, I also have Judy Smith here from administration from community services um, to support as well. Excellent, well thank you so much for the presentation. Um, Councillor Wright selected this item, so I'll go over to her. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jenny, for that uh, um, that that summary of the of the reports and that. I'm just wondering, you talked about the volunteer recognition. Um, is that to sort of, I, I guess, to um, because I understand subcommittee work. You don't receive um, those participants don't receive any sort of honorarium for. Is that right? So we're under that assumption with our budget that the honorariums are only for uh, the board members on the Community Services Advisory Board. Um, so we do want to make sure that we're providing that recognition uh, if the FCSS subcommittee is approved. Um, in the past two, we have had board recognition events. We've included a bit of the FCSS committee, but not as intentionally as we like to in the future. So we'd like to um, look at leading sort of a recognition event just with them because they do so much work in the community to support with the funding programs. And then it also we can look at sort of engagement opportunities because we have all the different funders as well um, and how we can support and create more of those connections. Okay. And, and I think with, is it just the FCSS, FCSS subcommittee that goes out um, uh, to the different agencies as well? Or is it the CI? I don't think CIOG members do, do they? Uh, no, so we do with the FCSS, we do program visits throughout the year. So we have the opportunity, the subcommittee usually leads the program visits along with administration, um, but the opportunity is open to the board so they can sort of see that connection piece. Um, we, I don't believe we've done uh, committee or having sort of on-site visits for the CIOG grant previously. It's mostly based off the operating fund piece, but we could also look at that in the future um, with admins granting program. Okay. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, because you're going to dissolve the CIOG subcommittee, right, according to the report? Okay. Um, and that, and you don't feel that will t um, take too much time? I understand it's more um, sort of numbers-based. So, yes, yeah, so the CIOG is more like overseeing the formula for the funding for the next year. So. Um, we'll have to do a review of that next year, um, but that work can just be led by the board. Um, in the past, the CIOG subcommittee has only been a few members that were just board members as well. So we'll just absorb that um, within the board moving forwards. Okay, perfect. And then your um, subcommittee meetings are all done um, online and with the support of, uh, of admin, right? Uh, we will need to review that for the FCSS subcommittee. So right now they aren't uh, being live streamed, but we can definitely look at that moving forwards. I will say because it is based off of granting funder decisions that um, we have to review some of those may have to be in private. Um, so we'll have to work with the Office of the City Clerk um, to make sure that's set up. Okay, okay. Um, and then I guess, I don't know, can I, can I ask the Office of the City Clerk or Molly? Um, is that still something that that can be supported then if, if things have to move into private, in and out of private and that? 
or would that be to Judy Smith? Uh, Councillor Wright, it's Nancy Jacobson. They, we oh. absolutely can look at whether or not the FOIP exceptions apply to move into private. The subcommittees get the same benefit that council does in terms of being able to apply that to their meetings. Okay, okay. But I just, I wanted to make sure that's not going to cause any additional resource requirements from administration that's already approved the, the subcommittee. It shouldn't be any more resource requirements than would otherwise be needed to run the subcommittee meeting to move into okay. private. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and then back to Jenny. I, I guess I just want to say thank you for the the quick turnaround on the the public spaces bylaw feedback um, that uh, the board provided. Um, it was it was good to have that information come forward. And um, I guess maybe at this point I will just move. Um, um, just make the motion to approve the subcommittee. So that the, the CSAP's request to establish the one subcommittee for the 2024 work plan is included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02275 be approved. Second. Great, so uh, we have a motion on the floor from Councillor Wright um, and we'll continue with questions. So Councillor Rice, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Salvador. Um, uh, thank you, Jenny, and for the presentation and the very good presentation provided lots of um, very uh, concise uh, information. Um, in terms of 2024 goal, uh, I, I look at these three goals. I did have question with CIOG, uh, but the concern right already asked, so I got the information for that one. Uh, for three goals, and are those three goals and uh, is in uh, the alignment with the mandate of the Community Services Advisory Board? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So those um, three definitely align with, so the mandate, we support long-term community services in Edmonton. Specifically, we support the community services department with the City of Edmonton um, to provide uh, advice on the different pieces. So the affordable housing along with the safety and well-being strategy are both under the community services department and aligned directly on that side um, and similarly with both of the granting programs fcss and ciog um, so we did review as a board to see what uh, priorities um, we should move forward with um, of course we know things have come up uh, next year too that impact long-term community services in the city of Edmonton where CSAB should have some feedback on so we will also adapt um, as needed within our work plan okay so um, that means and for those goals uh, the first just first two and are in online in alignment with the uh, uh, council's priorities and so we are expecting and uh, from this advisory board to get some advisors on the like uh, affordable housing and uh, prevention of uh, homelessness and also community safety and well-being so that is the uh, they go and for the 2024 and for the committee, right? Uh, yes, exactly. If there's other pieces that come up, like we work with Councillor Wright, so uh, she definitely does a great job as informing. If there's um, council reports coming up that we also um, should be involved in or providing some feedback on that. Um, so we do with those uh, two priorities, we work with admin directly to hear from presentations, um, their public engagement process. Um, but however, like as Councillor Wright mentioned, um, we can provide sort of a letter to council or speak to council too to provide that additional uh, feedback about any of those community services uh, pieces moving forward. Okay, so I, I heard some like the public engagement and also some letters and more is more about the um, advice on the policy side and from um, from public perspective. Okay, um, so in terms of CIOG, and then is uh, I heard this subcommittee uh, will be uh, formed to support that work, and so what expect uh, what we could expect from that that CIOG, and in terms of two thousand twenty four goal. Uh, so. 
to clarify, so CIOG, we wouldn't be requesting a subcommittee for, just that work would be absorbed by the board. Okay. Um, for that granting piece, our board's just going to have to review the funding model for next year to get re ready for that funding cycle. Um, so that'll be sort of the main goal under that granting piece, along with sometimes we hear from funders in the past that have questions or we have to review our policies um, as a whole. Um, and then SCSS is the one that we're requesting specifically the subcommittee for because it's quite more intensive, the work that goes into that granting program. Okay, I'm I'm sorry I missed that that piece, and then I thought this one subcommittee is about the CIOG. So that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, so I'm not seeing any further questions on the board. Uh, so anyone to speak to this before Councillor Wright closes? Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, sitting a few times uh, uh, with CSAB uh, in the last term. And uh, all I can say is you do uh, definitely the Lord's work for the city. So thank you so much. Uh, you do so much and uh, it's really appreciated and noticed. Um, uh, it, you know, I, I'm sure Councillor Wright will agree that uh, <laughs> that she's going to be closing, that uh, this is something that probably every councillor should be aware of the work you do and maybe experience it one time. So thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Uh, and I'll go to Councillor Wright to close. Thank you. And, and yes, I do agree with Councillor Paquette. Um, I do think it's very important work, um, you know, not only for the, the feedback and um, that they do provide and the, and the work they do in preparing that feedback, but also in helping to, to manage and decision those those grants. Um, the the FCS, FCSS grants are, are a huge part of the, the nonprofit organizations um, in our city. So being able to, uh, you know, make decisions and, 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 and grant those funds, I, I think, is, is something um, that we all need to appreciate. And then for the for the smaller groups, um, the way that the, the, the community investment operating grant um, was scaled back last year, I think they really took it upon themselves to, to look at, um, you know, how to, how to reassess uh, the needs of the different organizations and, and, and like I said, and, and scale those back. So I do appreciate all the work that they do um, and all the, the feedback and advice that they do provide to, uh, to, to us at City Council. So keep it up. Thank you very much. And that's all I have. Great. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Please vote. Councillor Principe is a yes. Uh, we have all the votes, thank you. Please display the vote. That's carried, great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, Jenny, really appreciate you being with us today um, and for the, the presentation and answers and, and really for the excellent work you do in our city um, and to, of course, the rest of the committee members as well. Uh, so we will move on to the next committee now, which is the Edmonton Design Committee. And we have um, Janice Mills. Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. And I see Molly's got uh, the presentation, so that's great. Yes. So we'll hand okay. the floor over to you and you can uh, start us off. Okay, sounds good. So good afternoon. I am Janice Mills. I'm the current chair of the Edmonton Design Committee. Uh, for simplicity, as I move forward, I may refer to the Edmonton Design Committee as EDC. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just a brief overview of the agenda. I'll briefly touch on the committee's mandate, our current membership, highlights from our past year, and the committee's uh, 2024 work plan. Next slide. Uh, so the mandate of EDC is to improve the city's urban design uh, qualities. We mainly do that per, by providing recommendations regarding development applications and also advice regarding urban design policies and principles. Um, so this mandate is met through regular review of development permit applications, both development permit and rezonings. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so per the EDC bylaw, the committee is formed by 12 members appointed by council. Six of those members are public members recruited through the office of the city clerk. The other six members are nominated by external professional organizations or councils. Uh, the current composition of the committee generally provides an interdisciplinary perspective on the review of projects from an urban design perspective. The committee has functioned very efficiently and effectively, uh, making meaningful recommendations to administration and council. Uh, the current committee also has a very good diversity in early, mid, and late career professionals, as well as a general diversity in both age, gender, and physical dis disabilities. Uh, next slide. So the next two slides just show um, uh, the split between both the public members recruited by the office of the city clerk and also uh, the externally nominated uh, members. Uh, some key things to note uh, is that in 2030 and 2031, we will have eight members reaching a maximum term um, and five of which are public members. Um, so right now there is a lot of conversation about consideration uh, to staggering committee membership terms within uh, the committee uh, and just making sure that special consideration is given to some of the professional organizations that have multiple member seats like uh, the AAA or the AALA or APPI. Um, so uh, just so that we have a continuity in consistency and knowledge transfer, et cetera. Um, one other thing to note is just for quorum, we want to make sure that care is taken to ensure that persons on the committee are from different employers. Um, and that's just to minimize the potential of any conflicts of interests and quorum uh, concerns. So next slide, maybe one more. Okay, so then we'll get into the highlights of 2023. Uh, so the first was reviewing development applications. This is the ongoing work of the committee to meet our mandate. Uh, EDC's agenda and submission packages are circulated to members and posted to the EDC website two weeks prior to the meeting. And this allows uh, members sufficient time to review and provide meaningful comments during the meetings. Uh, depending on the amount of applications, this, uh, this review can take upwards of five to 10 hours of the committee members' time. Uh, formal submissions coincide with the development permit and rezoning applications. Now, these are required for all projects that fall within the geographical boundary of EDC, as well as all of City of Edmonton projects. Um, with this, uh, presentations are split into formals and informals. An informal is a pre-consult with the EDC, and it allows for a more open dialogue with the committee members, um, offering suggestions to improve the project and clarifying the principles and standards that will be expected during the formal. It is the opinion of the committee that informal pre-consultations uh, is extremely valuable, and these conversations better prepare the applicants for the formal submission process. Uh, next slide. Uh, another large highlight from 2023 was the review of the EDC principles of urban design. The current principles of urban design um, that are referenced by EDC and industry have not been reviewed or updated since their original creation in around 2006. Uh, the update of the principles of urban design is to align with current city of Edmonton policies and to elevate design quality um, so that we can support inclusive, vibrant and durable durable publicly accessible spaces. Uh, the next step, which will be highlighted in our 2024 work plan is industry engagement. Uh, next slide. Uh, the committee from the 2023 work plan also had identified four other activities. Uh, the first two activities uh, were completed. So the first was onboarding training and tools. Uh, we created tools to ensure that new EDC members receive sufficient training um, on the committee's mandate, our scope, the processes and procedures. Uh, second, EDC supported the 2023 Edmonton Urban Design Awards. 
by identifying a committee member to sit on the planning committee, uh, which was Adrian Benoit. Adrian attended monthly meetings of the planning committee and contributed to the strategic advice that was critical to the success of the award program and gala. Um, the other two items were deferred um, and are being proposed on the 2024 work plan. Uh, next slide. So the 2024 work plan and goals, goal number one, again, is just the ongoing work. Uh, it's kind of the minimum to meet the mandate of the committee. Uh, EDC is requesting a subcommittee to complete goals two, three, and four. Um, this is mainly due to the present workload uh, and composition, mainly due to size of the committee, which does not allow for this work to be undertaken in an efficient manner. Um, establishing the subcommittee allows these actions to be undertaken in a much more focused and expedited manner. Um, so with that, goal two, three, and four, um, this work is anticipated to take approximately 200 hours, 40 hours times five subcommittee members. Um, and with the members of the subcommittee meeting meeting with administration on a monthly basis, uh, mainly virtual. Um, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge our City of Edmonton administrative liaison contributions. Peter Speary, Ashley Rowan, and by extension, Wes, are very invaluable to the success of the committee and subcommittee's works. Um, I would also like to acknowledge Councillor Paquette's continued support in the committee and subcommittee's work. Uh, briefly on goal number two, uh, this is to update the standards and procedures, um, and it's to fulfill our commitment to industry. We did a major uh, update and implemented the standards and procedures through subcommittee work through 2021 to 2023. Um, so that would just close that initiative off. Goal number three, completing the update of the Edmonton uh the EDC principles of urban design is to bring a completion uh, to the update of the principles of urban design, which have been completed this year. Uh, and then goal number four is initiating a review of the EDC boundary. Uh, and that would respond to input that we have received from industry um, and to allow the committee to examine models that would better align us with city plan. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate the presentation. So I believe this was selected by Councillor Knack. Do you have questions, Councillor Knack, or would you like us to go to the board? Just feel free to go to the speakers. I, I just loved hearing the presentation. Great. Thank you. Sounds good, Councillors. Uh, let's go to Councillor Paquette first. Oh, thank you. You didn't have to, but I appreciate it. Um, yeah, thank you for this update. Um, you, you you referenced this, and uh, maybe it should be something that all council hears. It's just like the impending amount of growth and what we're already experiencing that's coming as part of like the considerations of your work plan, as long as as well as climate resilience and different like building codes that are coming forward and things like that. So, uh, I'm just wondering if you want to expand on that, and also maybe touch a little bit on the capacity of uh, the design committee uh, to, uh, you know, basically face what is coming. Okay, that's a very, that's a very large question. Um, I would say from a capacity standpoint, the committee has been finding a, uh, s some efficiencies from working in a virtual uh, or a hybrid model. Um, so previously, I, I'm on my six year term and I will say when meetings were in person, it would take us a substantially more amount of time to review the same uh, applications. With that said, um, usually time commitment is one of the highest things that we hear from our members, uh, especially members who leave before their maximum term, uh, which is one of the big reasons why we, we would like to split some of the workload into subcommittees um, because then the subcommittees can be really focused on those goals without um, overloading some of the other committee members that are on there. Um, and as you noted, uh, one of the big players that's going to come into kind of the workload and capacity of, of EDC in the future 
is the review of the EDC boundary. Um, currently, right now, the boundary is, is very defined. Um, the work 2024 work plan for um, to start the review of the EDC boundary uh, would potentially open that boundary up wider um, to better align us with city plan. Um, I'm not sure if that fully answered your question. Yeah, it absolutely does. And I know that this is part of the work that you're currently embarking on. So I won't, you know, I'm, I didn't mean to put you on the spot for work that's forthcoming. Uh, so uh, I guess the next question is, um, you know, well, maybe it's not so much a question as, as a, well, let me put it this way. It, oh, over the past uh, decade or so, we've seen that uh, the urban design uh, in Edmonton has improved substantially. And so with this review, um, can Edmontonians expect uh, more of that? Because some people might say, well, you know, it's a lot better, still a little bit conservative. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if uh, we're going to see some things opening up in the future. I, I would say the current work that's being done uh, with the update to the principles of urban design will, will definitely um, help further the urban design presence within Edmonton. Uh, like I said, those principles of urban design hadn't been updated since 2006. And I think that update uh, definitely will further push uh, the urban design in Edmonton be more supportive of, you know, inclusive, vibrant, and durable, publicly accessible places. Yeah, and you, and you nailed it there because we'd heard from our uh, accessibility advisory earlier, um, and I, I know that that's something that's a, a huge priority as well uh, for Edmontonians and the design committee to, to ensure that we are future-proofing a lot of these designs. And uh, sometimes there's some pushback on that, but I think that uh, you guys are doing well. You know what? That's not even a question. I, it's just a statement. I just want to sing your praises all day. Um, we are so lucky, so blessed to have uh, the Edmonton Design uh, Committee. Uh, I can't even stress that enough. Just reading through the reports and the amount of time it takes me, I can't even imagine what you are putting into this heart and soul. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you so much. Really uh, appreciate all the work you're doing and, and particularly interested to hear about the um, principles of urban design that you're working on. Just wondering, I know we have a few conversations happening at City Council around our complete streets guidelines. Um, also, just how our uh, landscaping um, design requirements, you know, how those interplay with some of our operational needs in the long run. So just wondering if you are... Uh, if it's on your radar or, or if there have been any, any discussions with the committee around, you know, applying some of that urban design review to, um, you know, volume two of our design and construction standards or volume five uh, for our complete streets and our landscaping uh, design and construction standards? So currently it's not part of the 2024 work plans. Uh, as we're re reviewing uh, submission packages, et cetera, like we do review all of those components. Um, so we definitely reference those current documents that are out there. Um, but currently we're not actively involved as a committee in the update to those documents. Uh, there's been some instances where uh, we've been been engaged uh, in some of uh, conversations, et cetera, but not to a full extent as a stakeholder group. Okay, okay, great. That's really helpful. And uh, well, I mean, I guess that's an important question. If if there was work initiated on those, um, those design and construction standards, would the committee have the capacity to be a, a, a stakeholder at that table? Or would that require sort of adjusting some of the other priorities or, or other work plan items? I, I think that we definitely would have to look at the capacity of the committee in regards to that. Um, the EDC boundary review, uh, if it's anything like the past two major undertakings we've taken, will take quite a bit of effort. Um, but I think that, you know, depending on the role to be played in those, it, it could be work planned out through a subcommittee. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then finally, I know, uh, you know, I think Councillor Paquette raised, raised the question just to, in terms of, 
you know, if, if we see an increase in volume of, of applications, particularly with the boundary change, if that's that's a broader area. I know we had, I think, discussed last year the possibility of, um, you know, instead of having the full full committee to review applications, potentially having, I guess, subcommittees, but just, you know, panels of four or panels of five instead of the, the full panel of 12. Just wondering if there's been further discussion or conversation around that. <laughs> So currently there hasn't been further conversations regarding that just because our, our workload currently um, has been pretty consistent and there hasn't been a need to look at that. Um, currently, like I said, we found quite a few efficiencies by running virtual meetings. So um, when we were previously having meetings that would run plus four hours in duration, uh, the majority of the time we're keeping them less than four hours. Um, if the workload of the committee increases, uh, there's definitely, you know, with having three members from AAA and two members from APPI and landscape, et cetera, uh, there could be the potential to look at having smaller review panels. Um, one of the biggest assets I will say that I sort of touched on during membership um, is having such that diversity uh, of opinions uh, when we're reviewing these submissions. Um, so I think that would be something that we would have to discuss kind of in great detail so that we don't lose those, you know, differing perspectives that we get from the larger committee. Great, okay, well, thank you so much for your work and those were all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess one of the things that I notice in the report is that really intrigued me was the, the standards and procedures, updating the Edmonton Design Committee standards and procedures, and then the completing and updating the, the principles of urban design. Um, but when I look at this in the work plan, I don't see any further conversation that comes to council. And I was wondering why that is, because these seem very important for, you know, some of the topics we're talking right now about with housing affordability, um, uh, climate action, those kind of pieces. Like, I'm just wondering if there should be some sort of report to council at the end of 2024 with some of your findings, recommendations, the changes, even if it's an information report to council. Thoughts? Um, I, I, I know that our uh, city of Edmonton liaisons on on the call as well. Um, I, I think there are things that we definitely could put together a summary report. Typically, uh, the subcommittee is uh, we are providing that information back to the Greater um, Edmonton Design Committee through presentations, etc. So. Um, it's, it's something, I guess, if there is a request from council to have a report, that's that's something we definitely could work towards. Yeah, I think I, I do, I do, I guess, I, to the administration support on the call, uh, your thoughts on my line of questioning. Um, again, I think this would be a very valuable information report for council and the public. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I, I would just maybe make a note that the standards and procedures piece is uh, typically uh, administrative driven. Um, it's not something that was brought to council when it was done previously as it falls in the realm of the city manager. But uh, I think clearly um, the, the comment about the principles of urban design is something that um, we could work with the committee and subcommittee to um, you know, find find the best way to engage with council on that for sure. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, and and a lot of things that are delegated authority to the city manager still have information reports that come to council. Yeah. So I don't think uh, an in, a request for an inf information report is is unrealistic. Um, would uh, some sort of subsequent motion with a request for that to be an information report be required, or do I have commitment? So that's something that will be looked into and discussed further and brought forward, especially around, like you said, the, the principles of urban design. I, I don't see why a motion wouldn't be of help to just uh, keep us on track. Okay, 
Thank you. And then my other question was specifically related to the resources because the budget was quite significant and then not very much was spent in 2023 and now the budget is significantly lower again in 2024. So can you just help me understand that and yeah, what, what's going on there? Why are we anticipating so much less? Okay, so so Peter Peter and I sort of had an offline conversation about this. Um, I'm actually not sure where the eighty four thousand projected honorarium uh, came from because when you do the basic math of twelve committee members mm -hmm. times two hours times two meetings per month, et cetera, only gets you to fifty eight thousand. Um, so un unfortunately, I can't speak to where where the honorarium piece came from. Um, I would say the lower amount in the honorarium is through those efficiencies we found uh, going to a virtual platform. Mm -hmm. um, the, the meetings, we seem to be able to stay, you know, more focused, uh, especially with applicants coming in and doing presentations, etc. Um, they they just are more streamlined through this this virtual avenue. Um, so that's actually where we're seeing a, a lot of the honorarium savings in um, for that kind of discrepancy in the work plan budget. But you mentioned 58,000 by the rough math, but it's still only budgeted for 30,000. So if you do the if you do the math with the fifty eight thousand, that is saying that every meeting is going to run mm. four hours or longer, mm. uh, which okay. would get you to that two hundred dollars per person, et cetera. Um, and also that is the math of having all twelve committee members present uh, at a time, which definitely is is not always the case. Um, so we sort of took a look at it of a brush of, you know, most typical meetings run four hours a time. We gave, you know, a certain percentage to run over the four hours. And then we also looked at a committee attendance rate of about 85%, which is what is sort of reported in our membership report, uh, which is how we got to that $30,000 number. Okay. Thank you. I'm way out of time. I apologize. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Councillor Rutherford. It sounds like there will be a subsequent on its way, potentially. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, Councillor Paquette, uh, are you on to move the recommendation? I am. So, I would move that. Uh, I would. I would just make move, move the recommendation that we receive this information. Is that what the? I don't even know what the wording is to be honest. So. Um, maybe we, we can get the the clerk to pull that up on the screen. There we go. Fundamentally the same. Uh, so I'll move that the Edmonton Design Committee's request to establish one subcommittee for the 2024 work plan is included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report uh, as numbered be approved. Second. Second. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Knack, I think I heard you. Uh, great. So anyone to speak to this? I will at the appropriate time. Okay, seeing no one else on the board, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you to Councillor Rutherford for her good questions. I think that uh, as the design committee works through their uh, various uh, deliberations, that it is, uh, I think, quite likely that uh, Council can get an update on that. And so I'm not sure if we need a motion for it. I think if it makes someone comfortable, they, they can definitely do that. But uh, I think that we probably are getting a commitment here that uh, that work will be transparent. And uh, maybe it would uh, it would be nice if administration were to generate um, maybe a scenario where if council is interested, we could sit down and uh, just have a quick once over on that. But otherwise, I think it can probably be disseminated through email. And uh, then if there are questions, those can be flagged, which might ne necessitate a meeting or a report might not. So uh, we'll take it uh, as it goes as the work actually progresses. But uh, I see head nodding that we do have that commitment to get that information. Um, I just want to mention that uh, um, <laughs> former mayor uh, Mandel famously said no more crap his own words not mine 
pardon the unparliamentary language. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the professionals in our city who've uh, worked with the Edmonton Design Committee and uh, who are contributing to the city have taken that to heart. We can see so many really vibrant new builds happening, so many uh, interesting sort of uh, uh, forms and so many like really uh, um, beneficial approaches to design that benefit the community. And uh, I'm excited for this uh, work plan. I'm ex excited for the review because we're going to see even more of that and at an accelerated pace. So it, it really is a fascinating time to be involved in this field and what it means for a city that is growing incredibly rapidly and in a changing world. Um, you don't always wish uh, interesting times on people, but if you have them, get interested. And uh, the EDC does just that. Um, I, I've said it before, I'm going, to, I'm going to say it again. We are just absolutely blessed as a municipality to have these folks working um, on these things. Uh, you know, not to, not to give anyone ideas, but uh, doing it this way saves us so much money and also brings in so many uh, viewpoints from people who are absolute experts at their field that um, it would be very difficult for us to do in any other way. And uh, really, uh, these folks are just putting in their time and their energy because they love this city and they love the work. And uh, and, and what a benefit uh, for all of us. So thank you to the EDC uh, and thank you to council. And especially also thanks to administration for the uh, unsung work. So thank you, Madam Chair. Well said, thank you, Councilor Briquette. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice, for being with us. And um, um, I'm just doing my subsequent. And uh, we do just have a subsequent, so you might want to hang on just a second. Yep. So I'm just pulling it up. Sorry. Um, that administration and the Edmonton Design Committee prepare an information report outlining the new proposed principles of urban design and return to committee. Second. Great, would you like to briefly introduce Yeah, just I think that, uh, again, there's so much here that I think circles around so many of the pieces that we as a council have been talking about with climate, you know, even that where we're at talking about the solar panels and just sometimes the design of adding a peak can limit that. Uh, we've talked about housing affordability and how important that is. And so I think, you know, having, having an understanding of how our design principles are, are helping achieve those goals, I think is always a really good conversation and one that I, I think the public would also appreciate uh, being aware of. So that's, that's why I think it would be beneficial for report. And when I asked uh, the administration in my line of questioning, they said that, that a motion would be preferred just to be clear on that. So that's why I'm putting this forward. Great, thank you. Uh, so any questions, Councillor Paquette? No, just to speak. Great, uh, so seeing no further questions, Councillor Paquette to speak. Yeah, I, I support this motion. We already got the soft uh, commitment that it was that uh, this was going to be forthcoming anyway, so we might as well formalize it. Um, the only uh, thing that I would mention is that uh, these folks um, really, really put a lot into this. And so if we are going to ask for an information report, um, and probably this goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, just so that uh, the folks on the EDC can hear it too, um, that, that council is very prepared uh, for, uh, for that report. And uh, you know, apparently it looks like it will probably be a committee meeting to be very prepared, have very uh, um, good questions and be mindful of the, uh, the time and uh, respect the expertise of those who will be coming to speak. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford, would you like to close? Yeah, I I couldn't agree more with what Councillor Paquette said. I think that's what the intent of this motion is. I, th I think many Edmontonians don't realize a lot of the work that we do, and I think giving them a concrete example of what the Edmonton Design Committee does 
uh, would absolutely be a benefit in, in a public discourse and space. It also gives other folks, you know, committees are always great because it gives Edmontonians writ large an opportunity to engage with a committee that they wouldn't normally get to to chat with or converse with. So I think there's a lot of benefits to this. And, and as always, uh, I have no doubt that with the passion around this this table for, for everything design and planning and uh, making an Edmonton the greatest Edmonton it can be, that it will be an engaging and well prepared for conversation. Great, thank you so much. Please vote. We're just missing Councillor Jans, and we have all the votes. Please display the votes. That is carried. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Janice. I uh, really appreciate all of your work and really looking forward to the conversation at committee about the principles of urban design. Thank you. Take care. All right. So um, up next, we have the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Uh, and I believe we have uh, Maya and Jacob joining us. Yes, excellent. Hi, folks. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, so we will turn the floor over to you for a brief presentation and then uh, likely there will be questions from uh, council colleagues. Great, thanks. So I'll just give a bit of an overview and then uh, we can both take questions together because we have uh, both me and Jacob here today as co-chairs. So uh, thanks for having us both. Uh, I would like to start by acknowledging that uh, the Earth's average surface temperature in 2023 was the hottest on record since record keeping has begun in 1880. So we've seen an increase of 1.17 Celsius, um, hotter than 19th century averages. So as you might imagine, uh, this made for a fairly frightening 2023 for our ETCRC members. That said, we saw a lot of great things happening in our city. Uh, we saw the passing of the new zoning, zoning bylaw. We also saw the approval of uh, and you know, continued ongoing work uh, dedicated towards the active transport system. Uh, we also did see some scary stuff uh, within the city and beyond. Um, across the country, we saw record-breaking wildfires. Uh, we saw over 16.5 million hectares of land burned. We saw wildfires take over nor uh, the northern Canada and Edmonton provided shelter for evacuees seeing re seeking refuge. Uh, and so that obviously gives us an important context towards our work, both in last year and this coming year. So with all that in mind, I'm going to just move us into uh, what we had set as our priorities for the last year. We set out six different priority areas and a lot of our work fell within these, uh, these domains. So I'm just gonna list them off and list kind of like one or two achievements uh, or you know, kind of the ways that we engaged with those priorities. So the first was to instill culture change. Um, and what we did for this is that we met up with the city manager to better understand how the ETCRC could support the city in achieving our climate goals and really start changing um, you know, the city culture around uh, realizing that every decision we make is a climate decision. Um, we really strongly supported the creation of the climate task force and the hiring of the chief climate officer. Our second priority was land use, uh, district planning, uh, and zoning bylaw renewal. So for this, we wrote a memo regarding uh, the in support of the zoning bylaw renewal, although we clearly indicated that it did need to be much more centered around the climate crisis, and we do hope to see more movement in this direction this year. Our next priority was transportation. So we received multiple presentations on fleet zero emission vehicle transition, the city light duty fleet EV strategy, and we also got a bike plan update. Uh, we were pretty confused as to how and why the city purchased more diesel buses considering all of these goals, but we do hope to continue to work together in identifying ways to truly achieve a net zero fleet in the near future. Uh, buildings was another priority area for us. Uh, we recognize that this is a bit of a spicy area for our committee. Um, we, we know that there are some sensitivities around buildings and building codes uh, and the provincial government, but we really do hope to continue to work with council in identifying what levers the city does have and can utilize um, you know, to encourage progress in this area uh, within our scope. 
Uh, and then our next priority was energy systems. Uh, so the committee is working on organizing a presentation to council on hydrogen, and we started that work uh, already and are continuing it into this year. Um, so we want to talk about when it makes sense to use and when it does not, and we really hope that you all attend. Uh, our last priority area was equity and health. Uh, and so our committee worked closely with a University of Alberta professor. Uh, her name is Dr. Shirley Harper, and sh her and her students created a climate health communications primer that really aimed to help uh, counselors and really anyone talk about the intersection between climate change and health. Uh, and of course, this is an area that we really do want to lean more into, into 2024. Uh, and we really would love to work more closely with council about that. So if this is an area that you want to learn more about, we can certainly set some stuff up for you guys. Uh, we had six meetings last year. We had four new members who started their term at the start of 2023. We wrote two memos. Uh, we had the tree preservation bylaw memo and the zoning bylaw renewal memo. Uh, we had four of our members speak at council uh, at one of the public hearings on October 17th about the bylaw renewal. In terms of expenses, our primary expenses were honorariums. Um, so we spent $2,550 on, on honorariums for our members. This was far below the projected uh, cost, which was uh, $11,600. And uh, travel and parking was, you know, $209-ish, and then other was $106-ish, you know, point something. Uh, in terms of resources, we required 37.5 uh, hours of staff support. We currently uh, have six subcommittees. We have action on buildings, adaptation, clean energy, climate emergency and culture change, strategy and planning, and transportation. So that's sort of um, last year. And in terms of our work plan for 2024, we really have three main goals. The first is ensuring council is provided with the best and balanced information to, um, whoop, sorry, lost my spot, to make climate decisions. Our second goal is to continue to support culture change, both within city admin and the community. And our final goal is to continue to provide feedback to administration on energy and climate related work. Uh, in terms of subcommittees going forward, um, you know, we would like to dissolve all six of our subcommittees and instead request approval for one single subcommittee, which we would call the Action and Response Subcommittee. Our rationale for this is that there are times when the committee needs to meet in addition to regular committee meetings. For example, sometimes we need to write a memo to address uh, specific timely subjects, uh, or we need to spend more focused time on committee work. It would also allow us to bring in speakers, uh, you know, who are relevant towards our, um, you know, our priorities and our goals, uh, you know, and perhaps do that uh, in between committee meetings, uh, you know, if it's, again, a lot of our work is very timely, so uh, it does sometimes mean we need to um, move quickly, so it would be nice to be able to do that. Um, we do realize that we are running out of time for strong transformative climate action. We also realize that resources are finite, and we really are grateful for all the support we've received thus far from the city. Ultimately, we are finding ourselves over inundated with climate work, which we're happy to do. But of course, uh, it would be nice to get approval for a subcommittee with the mindset that um, we may not even necessarily have to use it every year. We could see each year um, seeing a range of zero potentially all the way to four meetings at the most. We do meet six times a year, so, you know, it would kind of be in between uh, meeting times. Uh, and so I think one of the messages that we really wanted to put out there is that um, even though there may not be a lot of resources to support additional meetings right now, it would still be great to get approval for the subcommittee so that in future years, maybe even in 2025, when maybe there are more resources, we could then, um, you know, a as it comes up, get approval for additional meetings. Um, and it would also help future committee members to have this uh, subcommittee pre-approved now, even if we can't utilize it to its fullest potential uh, right away. So um, that's really it in terms of our membership report. I just want to end off saying a really big thank you to our counselors, Ashley and Michael, who have been uh, so kind and supportive of our work. And we also wanted to give a huge shout out and thank you to Heather Morrison, who has been beyond helpful to the committee and specifically to us co-chairs. Um, and so with that, we're happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much. Uh, now I know Councillor Knack uh, had selected this. Do you have questions, Councillor Knack, or would you like to um, go to anyone else? Happy to defer to Great. others. Sounds good. Uh, so I'll look to the board. 
And if not, uh, I have a few. So I believe next in line would be Councillor Knack to take the chair. I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, really appreciate the presentation today and, and all of your ongoing work. Um, you know, you operate in such a challenging space with a very challenging mandate. Uh, I guess a few questions. So just on the subcommittee, um, so can you just elaborate a little bit? So you'd said you're essentially dissolving six to make one. Is that right? Yeah, so we we really had, um, you know, a subcommittee for this topic and a subcommittee for that topic. And really what we're asking for is to just have one catch all committee that could really be flexible um, and nimble in doing whatever work was needed and necessary. Um, so, you know, perhaps it might not mean all the committee members join for all of the all of the subcommittee meetings. It would really depend on their interest area and expertise and what is kind of needed in the moment. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, and do we have folks from administration on as well? Because I know uh, in the report it did mention that there were concerns around resourcing for the subcommittee. Um, oh, I do see Chandra, great. Uh, yeah, so just looking for a little bit of feedback there um, and the idea of approving the subcommittee or sort of having it pre-approved even if meetings can't happen quite yet uh, was shared. Is that something that might be a viable path forward? It could be a, a path forward, you know, typically there, so there's six um, public meetings a year. We're typically spending, you know, about 80 hours uh, of mid time for each of those meetings, just, you know, due to organization, the actual meetings, the back and forth. Um, and so um, the subcommittee meetings would have a resource implication for sure. Um, there, there's the potential also to have special meetings in place of subcommittee meetings to address kind of um, urgent or immediate issues uh, that would uh, take less staff time, probably more of an eight hour type of thing than um, an 80 uh, hour uh, commitment. Um, and I just like to highlight that the team is, you know, Heather is highly productive. So it's not like she's milking <laughs> those 80 hours. Like that's actually um, a high performer um, in, um, you know, the, the multiple uh, coordination efforts there, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess with the, so with the special meetings as sort of an alternative to subcommittee meetings, what are the, like, what are the limitations there just in terms of the structure? Um, like could, it, could it essentially function the same way? Because it sounds like the committee is really looking for that, uh, the ability to gather um, and and do so in a way that is flexible, adaptable when things come up um, and, and issues arise or, or uh, reports of interest arise. Could a special meeting be called in those contexts? It could. I think the what you might lose would be... Um, so there wouldn't be um, substantive public notice given around when that meeting would occur. It'd be sort of a 24 hour notice, like there's procedural requirements around agendas. Um, and then potentially we would not be able to um, bring in additional presenters on such short notice. Uh, so I think that would be a, a red flag to flag to the committee there that there could be limitations around having uh, additional um, participants and um, speakers join. Right, okay, and then just over to the um, to the co-chairs, thoughts on that and sort of using the special meeting structure as uh, an alternative to a formal subcommittee to allow for those types of meetings? Yeah, I think, you know, just hearing everything, uh, thank you, Chandra, for, for kind of outlining the differences. I think I would probably stay, you know, it's like, I think I would probably stand by the, the ask of wanting the possibility of a subcommittee. Again, even if it's for 2025, just to have it pre-approved um, and, you know, maybe gi giving the special meetings uh, a chance. But it does sound like there are some limitations, at least, you know, in terms of if we need to get speakers together and things like that. Um, but ultimately, you know, we also recognize that there's only so many resources to go around. So um, I, I wonder if it, there could be understanding that, you know, we can get the subcommittee approved, knowing that we may not be able to have any meetings and try to work with the sub like of a special meeting framework um, and, and see how it goes. But, you know, again, uh, it, it would still just be nice to have that subcommittee there um, just in case. And if we have enough notice and maybe not this year, but maybe 
there, right? When there are more resources for something like that, um, it certainly would be, um, we'd be willing to, you know, do our best to work with you to try to make it as least resource intensive as possible, whatever that means. Okay. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, I'll probably come back for another round uh, and maybe do some work in the background here. Uh, but I'll go to Councillor Rutherford. And well, I'll return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Neck. And now I'll go to Councillor Rutherford. Thank you. I'm just going to follow up on Councillor Salvador's because there's there's only two committees that administration just didn't say they had support, and I really see an equity issue here. Um, you know, with how advisory committees are supported. Um, I one of the questions, I guess. And I don't know if it it would be to I'm going to go to the clerk uh, for do we get like a pool of budget sort of similar to like how with council we have individual award budgets but then we have like a common budget is there anything like that because like I'm just thinking about the design committee for example just had you know had a much bigger budget in 2023 like is there that money that's now could be allocated somewhere else do you get what I'm trying to ask here. I, I believe I follow. Yes, no, it's not the same structure. So each one of these budgets is housed within the department that it's assigned to. There isn't a common pool other than the small administrative support of the folks that you see sitting in front of you to do the back end work in the office of city clerk. Okay. Um, so I guess to administration, what do you need to make that subcommittee a reality? Um, Councilor Rutherford, I think as pitched where we try it <laughs> and, and maybe we'll learn that maybe the, the resource implications aren't as substantial as um, the true um, committee meetings. I, I think we could pitch it to try maybe one in, or two in uh, 2024 to understand what the, the full resource implication is. I was estimating probably 40 hours per subcommittee. So it's still a week um, of time for each subcommittee potentially. Uh, if that's, if we're able to do that more efficiently, um, we could, but g I, I given, think, oh, sorry. I was just saying, I'm just at a loss because I feel like we have put so much resources into climate action and like, our chief, we're hiring right now a chief climate officer and all of this stuff, yet we seem to not have enough resources to, to provide the same level of service to this important advisory committee as we do to other advisory committees. This is what I'm really grappling with. So like, I really wanna know, like, do you need a full-time staff position? Do we need to, reprioritize within the current resources like what needs to happen because I don't think that that's a good message for 2024 personally to say we'll just give it a try with a couple of subcommittees when we're saying that this is one of our biggest issues that we're facing as as a community and as a society so I, I that's what I'm grappling with right now so I, I, no, I agree. what's the path to get them their subcommittee what I agree. What, what budget what resources what staffing is required yeah, in an ideal world, we would have a dedicated FTE that we could use to support the committee when, you know, this is like the the, the struggle that we have is, you know, every um, piece of work we do is really important on the file. So if we're if we're taking an FTE from um, like community activation programming, that's the, the that's the internal trade offs. But they are an incredibly important committee, uh, absolutely deserving of the resources they need to be able to provide those res uh, to provide the advice they do. Uh, it's it's just um, a tricky place. We I mean the council did provide. Um, additional budget through a composite in 23 to 2026. We could allocate that um, funding um, to uh, an additional staff if that's the will of council. Okay, I, I see the committee member has their hand up. So I'll just give you my last bit of time and then I'll listen to my colleagues for their thoughts on this, but I see. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you, um, you know, asking these questions. I think they're really valuable questions. Um, and, you know, and I, I really just want to reemphasize, like, you know, it, that we're willing to work with it to be flexible. And like, maybe it's a virtual meeting, maybe it's an hour long instead of three. Uh, and so if we, we're certainly flexible in, in figuring out ways to make these things work, um, you know, and whatever, if that helps at all. Appreciate that. I'm out of time. I see other people on the board, so I'll listen to my colleagues, and then I think Councillor Salvador says she had another round too. So I'll listen, and we'll we'll come up with something. Thanks, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, I think maybe just on on that uh, on this topic, which I think is an important one, um, maybe to administration. Am I correct? Like, I'm. Is it? Is it the structure of it being a council advisory body in terms of the meetings having to be public? Like, is that part of the structural reason that leads to, to some of the additional um, resource demand on your team? Yes, the procedural requirements um, are um, add to that time involved um, with having a, a public meeting and making sure it's live streamed and. Uh, all of that requires additional time. Yeah, and I think that's that's a real challenge just in terms of, um, like what I'm hearing is that there's there's a lot of appetite and desire to support the, the content of those um, meetings, um, but that these procedural uh, pieces are adding, you know, and potentially taking away from some of the core work that's happening. So maybe just to to the administration that's in the room, do we have any flexibility around that or are we really bound by the, the bylaws in place? It's not even so much by the bylaws, it's a provincial requirement that these okay. meetings happen in public. Um, and that happens anytime it's a council committee. Your alternative would be to have it on the administrative side, but that defeats the purpose of it being a council advisory committee. Yeah, yeah, so I, I feel a real tension there. Just, I'm in some ways reluctant to you know, I, I want to support the conversations and the dialogue that's happening at the committee, but it's also it feels challenging to divert some of our resources to, you know, procedural requirements that uh, aren't aren't the content of, of the work. So that's just to throw another wrench in the discussion, I guess. Um, maybe just just leaving that aside for now, I did want to connect with the committee to say, you know, how valuable I find your, your advice and the work that you're doing. Um, in terms of the work plan that's coming up, so really appreciate, um, uh, so, you know, the goals that have been outlined. And I think, you know, we, we spoke maybe previously about, um, or, or an area of interest for me is particularly around our district energy systems. Um, just how we, again, we've, we've got an ambitious plan around that. We have a lot of budget behind that and just ensuring that we've got um, good advice from your group in terms of how we make best use of those resources. So wondering where that is um, on, on your radar and what type of work the committee might be able to do to support us through this next year. That's always a priority for us. So I think we're aligned on that point. Uh, we will, we are also planning um, I don't think it showed up in this presentation, but we are planning another memo, like a larger memo, memo um, partly why we discuss these subcommittees, but we are planning a larger memo to discuss district energy utility um, and that kind of stuff. So that is also one of our big priorities. Um, so look for that this year for sure. Great, great, really appreciate that. Uh, sorry, actually, I'll just swing back to administration again, uh, Ms. Jacobson, if, if sorry to interrupt. Um, the, uh, um, the provincial requirements, so I know that, again, as council, if we sort of have quorum, so a couple of us can get together and we can chat, but if we get to quorum, then, then all of the uh, legislative requirements kick in. Is it the same for an advisory committee? Yes, and it's not just quorum. There's a number of indicia that go into whether or not a meeting. Quorum obviously is a big one um, because you don't have a valid meeting without it. But anytime you're meeting and advancing the business or making decisions that would be in line with things that you would normally discuss as a, a body in public, then it's going to start to look like a meeting. And I assume that there's a bit of gray there. I mean, decision making is clearly another, you know, very definitive point. Um, if it's a discussion of topics 
I assume that that there is an ability. I mean, I don't think we could we could do our work without being able to discuss the topics outside of of these of this room. Agreed. I, I, this is a gray area, and there's a lot of case law that helps you decide what a meeting is not, and they look at a number of factors. But if you're advancing something forward mm -hmm. without a policy direction, so a good example we usually use is if a policy decision is made, and then there's an offline conversation about carrying that out and what the wordsmithing is, that's probably not a meeting. But if you're advancing a policy discussion, right, that's going to be so, required. So there could be potentially um, ways that, that committee members could connect to discuss um, in advance of a formal meeting where, where the matters would be brought forward more formally? Within a very limited scope, it's a gray area and it would have to be done very carefully. Okay, okay, well thank you, thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Neck, could you take the chair, please? Uh, I've got the chair. Sorry, actually. Can I, can I <laughs> point of order, can I move a second round first? Yes, please. Second. Please vote on a second round. We have all the votes. Please display the votes. That's carried. Now can you take the chair, Councillor Neck? Yeah, now I've got the chair, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so a few questions, I guess, just for, for administration here. I'm just grappling with process. So if, yeah, you know, my desire is to to ensure that the committee can carry out the work that they need to carry out in the most efficient way possible. And, and I'm hearing from the co-chairs that that would be through, through a subcommittee that um, has the flexibility to meet so that the entire group doesn't have to, have to get together for um, sort of uh, ad hoc topics or, or issues that need to be responded to. So if, if we were to, to move a motion that asks for a report back with, um, information on resourcing to support the subcommittee. Uh, I guess, when could we when could we expect to get something like that back? Because um, I'm, I'm trying to give this, uh, the, the committee some degree of certainty that, uh, you know, we want to move forward on this, but um, it does sound like we need to do a little bit of work to understand uh, what that resourcing looks like. I'm gonna look to Chandra on that one because that would come back from the department. I don't feel like council's gonna be happy with this answer, but our report process is sort of three months. <laughs> like from the time we get a motion till the time it goes. So it's not necessarily the most timely um, way of sharing that information back. Just um, again, due to uh, process involved. Um, yeah. It wouldn't take, yeah, it, we, we could write a report relatively quickly. Okay, and I just want to understand what it would look like. So if I were to move something to that effect um, as a subsequent, uh, but we did approve the recommendation in the report to, to give approval for the subcommittee, what would that look like? Is that doable? Maybe to... So it, it would depend if we can get a commitment that there is enough resourcing for at least some type yeah. of subcommittee, then you could do that to look at broader resourcing. If you don't have a commitment to resourcing for subcommittees at all, it would be in place of and you'd get the report first before you approve it. Okay, and um, did I hear correctly from uh, from Chandra, like is it, is it possible to do at least a couple meetings with um, the current status quo and then by that time we'll have the report back for future resourcing opportunities? Yes. Yes? Yeah, I think, you know, just in terms of like a, a a people manager, like, uh, I would estimate it would be 40 hours kind of of Heather's time. And so like it's a, compared to a special meeting, which would be eight hours. So it's a lot easier for <laughs> me to confidently say like Heather could probably squeeze in eight hours um, between because she's fantastic. But to say an additional week, we ongoing. Uh, yeah, I, I think we need to look at that. Okay. Okay. So with that in mind, um, I'm... Just gonna pull up the recommendation here. Um, yeah, so I am gonna move the recommendation and then follow that up with the subsequent as I described. Uh, so I'll move that the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee's request to establish one subcommittee for the 2024 work plan as included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC zero uh, two two seven nine be approved. Second. 
Thank you. I, was that seconded by Councillor Rutherford? Uh, Councillor Stevenson, but who's? Oh, going Stevenson. To... Sorry, I can't see pictures. I can I can hear voices, and I didn't do a good job. Uh, perfect. Uh, are there any other questions on the motion on the floor first? Councillor Principe. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, Councillor Salvador, um, if you're following up with a subsequent potentially, uh, if that report came back with a substantial amount of resources necessary, at that time, would we look at um, how we could resource the committee, the subcommittee? Yeah, I mean, my expectation is that that or would... like, what is your what would happen after the report? Yeah, so my yeah. my expectation Sorry is to that... jump in. it's it's a fantastic question, but might be relevant. But there is no subsequent. Yeah, and so until yes. the subsequent comes on, I, I feel we're debating a hypothetical, which I know is coming, but right now, uh, uh, yeah. So I don't I don't mean to uh, to cut off the conversation, but but. For the sake of where we're at, we should actually just focus on the original motion. And we've heard a desire from the mover to move a subsequent, but until that comes, can I can I hold us off on that debate? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you have any yeah, questions, no, that's okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're. Uh, focusing on the on the pieces oh, here. Oh so. yeah, no, that makes sense. That that makes sense, Councillor Nack. Yes. Um, is there a possibility that we could look into? You know, I'll I'll let Councillor Rutherford go ahead. Okay, we can always come back to Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I see the I see the intent here, but I'm just focused on the the motion in front of us. And you know we're hearing there isn't resources, but you mentioned something to administration about a composite profile. What is currently earmarked for that composite profile? Or is it still to be allocated to various initiatives? Um, yeah, so I, I, I couldn't off the top of my head give you the full allocation, but it's um, to do the permanent SEEP program. What's SEEP? Um, Sorry, what's SEEP? Sorry, I uh, pardon me. The clean energy improvement program, okay. um, the the green piloting program. So there's a, a various um, some new initiatives that that is providing. There may be still flexibility within what we have that we're not pulling away from some of those new initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I wouldn't be able to to give you the best answer today. Okay, but the composite is meant to yeah. Um, was used for some of these big ones. Like we're we're hoping to advance um, a multi-year energy poverty program using that composite funding, the green permitting um, pilot this year, uh, the clean energy improvement. Those are uh, three top of mine. Yeah, okay, because I, I want to support this, but we don't know what could happen with the subsequent. The subsequent could fail. And so we prove this and then the subsequent fails, we're in a bit of a conundrum. So I'm trying to strengthen and think about amendments to this motion on the floor. So that Maybe. regardless, go ahead. I mean, so I've got an idea. Um, is it possible, depending on the wording of the subsequent, it could be a point two to this motion and then it could be debated together. So if there's, if it's in order, without knowing the draft wording, that could be our way forward so you could debate this holistically. That might be, I, uh, that would be something that I, I would definitely appreciate to the mover. Could could that be a possibility? Absolutely. Um, I, I think it could be, I would just look so to. So can I, can I um, do a friendly amendment because you can't amend your own motion yes. to the wording that you had for the subsequent? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but councillors, I agree. I think one option here could be to make it a part two motion and have part one, if you want to do an amendment at the same time, to state within existing resources to be very clear that you are approving with what's available today and do the subsequent, as we've sort of alluded to, to talk about looking at options for the future. Yeah, I don't love the within existing resources because they're saying they don't have resources and I think that there is resources. So there's a bit of a tension already there um 
but I think we need to be able to look at all of it together comprehensively. So I would appreciate if I, if that could be a friendly amendment to add that. Uh, that yeah, what I'll do, what I'll do, we're going to treat a little to, bit. Of, yes. I'll, I'll actually go further and just say if we could let the original mover restate, we can, okay, perfect. they're okay with withdrawing and then restating. That can let us cleanly do this instead of that. So Excellent. I'm going to just double check that everyone's okay with them withdrawing so we can restate. Good. Not hearing any Councillor Salvatore. You want to restate the motion? Yes. So that the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee's request to establish one subcommittee for the 2024 work plan as included. Oh, disappeared. Uh, as included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02279 be approved. Uh, and that administration prepare a report outlining information on administration resources required to support a subcommittee of the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee and return to committee. And that's still seconded by Councillor Stevenson? Yes, perfect. And we'll just get the updated wording there and then we'll go back onto the board. So I just still have a follow-up question about the, if, can yeah. I continue my time? Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, Councillor Neck, thank you. Um, so with that motion though, is there, we're looking at getting it back in March, is that what I'm understanding? The, the, the second part? We would be seeing March is that so we have a stop gap of like wait what month what month are we in right now <laughs> jeez okay so if if we approve this today and then when is that report coming back in sixteen weeks or three months is that correct I don't, yeah off the top of my head it, I, I I seem to think it takes about three months from the time we get a motion to get it through the full process. Um, so what resources, what is the dollar amount or the staff complement that is needed for the stop gap between the three months to make we sure? Will, we, will, we will absorb that. Um, we, we thought we would have sort of that eight hours of capacity for some special meetings that would pop up. So it'll be just us staging uh, our work. We'll delay some pieces so that uh, for whatever those a subcommittees are during that time we can resource that okay and does that is that amenable to the committee looking to maya and jacob yeah i think so i mean again we're, we're really happy for anything and we're really grateful that this discussion is happening and um you know whatever kind of happens from here just let us know how we can help and support and you know if there's any dis further discussion that needs to happen um we're definitely happy to to do that we don't want to be bothered, so um, we can figure out a way to do this other ways if need be, but. Okay, no, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Uh, since there's two folks on the board for questions uh, and we're just approaching 3.30, I think we will take our break so we don't go into the break. So we're just taking a 15-minute break. Uh, we'll come back at 3.43. And we're on recess until then.
<laughs> we are live on uh, the streaming. Thank goodness. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, let's call us back to order at 3.43. Uh, we'll do a quick roll call. And uh, now I've got to reimagine the room as I go throughout again. So, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, then it's me, then Councillor Principe. Hello. Hello, Councillor Paquette. Uh, um. Is it Councillor? I thought it was Councillor Steven, uh, Councillor Paquette, then Councillor Stevenson. Now I don't remember anything. Councillor Stevenson? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Stevenson is always first. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang, uh, I don't believe she's with us. Uh, uh, Mayor Sohi is also not uh, here yet. Uh, Councillor Hamilton is also away, if I understand on city business. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. Delightful, delightful greeting. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Salvador? Yeah, good afternoon. And Councillor Cartmel. Well, hello. Hello. Uh, Councillor Rice. Hello. And Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think that's everyone. We'll pretend it is. Let's go back to the board. I think Councillor Stevenson was next on the list for questions for uh, the motion on the floor. Thank you. I. We, I think, I believe that the motion is currently just as it was originally stated. Um, uh, no, there should be the two points. So yeah, we'll get the updated motion on the board so you can see it with the two points. Oh yes, thank you very much. So in, in section two uh, or part two, just to administration, would we be able to look at, because I think, again, I, I've been feeling this tension in our conversation just in terms of, um, you know, how we make best use of administration's time. So I'm wondering if the point two would be an opportunity, would we be able to have um, a bit of a, a very high level analysis in terms of, you know, if we provide the additional resources to support the subcommittee, what work would not proceed and sort of what administration would advise in terms of the the area of highest value? Yes, we could do that. I'm also wondering if you would just like us to do that and send a memo identifying what it was. Like, you know, us prioritize uh, within our file and identify uh, what we think would be like the least impact um, and uh, provide a, a memo update to council. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly open to that, but, but would leave it uh, to the mover for some consideration there. Maybe another thought too is just in terms of how, um, Again, identifying what, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave it there actually. Maybe I'll just ask that to the mover then. Uh, do you have a preference over a, a memo versus a report? I think both are okay, but just wondering your thoughts. Yeah, I um, just wanna make sure it's actionable, I guess, uh, when, when we get that information, depending on what we get, of course. Um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. Uh, okay, no, no, fair enough. And I think what I'm hearing, I th okay, but just to clarify to the mover, maybe. So what I'm hearing from administration is that they are going to, they are going to find the resource to support this committee, and then the report that they will come back with will just discuss how they've reallocated within their existing resources and maybe what's not happening as a result. So maybe that's a good point of clarification. Um, not that I could ask questions right now, but my, my understanding and my intention is to, in the first part of the motion, ensure that uh, the committee has um, a degree of certainty that they'll be able to establish the subcommittee they need to in order to, to carry out the work in their work plan, um, at least for the interim and in the immediate period until we get 
part two of the motion, the report back. I have heard from administration that they, they will be able to support um, the committee or, or subcommittee in carrying out that work. Part two would ensure that we get the information back to um, provide sustainable resourcing for the right. subcommittee. Okay, thank you. That, that clarifies for me, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go to Councillor Prince Faye because I didn't really give her a first round, so. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, so now we have both of those um, uh, on the floor. So now I can speak to both of them or ask questions on both of them. Uh, I, I am concerned because we heard from Chandra that um, there is um, a resource it's not within the resources. So uh, I, I just thought that uh, Ms. Jacobson, I believe it was you who had said that maybe we could put something in, possibly like to make an amendment that's saying to um, within existing resources. Was that the term you used, Ms. Jacobson? That was, that was a suggestion if you wanted to include it in part one to be very clear that your approval is limited to what administration can currently support until you receive part two. Yeah, I would like to propose that I would like to make that amendment. And again, I, what I would like to say is that I would like to see it follow through. And I know Councillor Rutherford has said uh, a point about equity and I, I understand that and I appreciate that. But also, you know, this is the only committee that will have uh, a chief officer within ELT as well, right? So I think that that will help also to forward um, uh, and contribute to fulfilling council's priorities. So I would like to suggest that you know, make an amendment that we add within existing resources to line one. Right. I'll uh, let's see if there's a seconder for that. And we can check if it's friendly or not after we get a seconder. So I can. Seconded by Councillor Rice. I'll check to see that. It, do, do folks feel that is friendly? And I see a couple nodding heads. Is there anyone who does not feel that's friendly? And don't worry if you feel it's not friendly. You're allowed to say no. Uh, but I'm not yes, hearing anyone. I think it's oh. not friendly. Okay, I I, 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 I you think know, that's okay. And Perfect. I just want to say, in hindsight, so what I'm going to do, I just so I've got the motion on the floor from Councillor Prince Bay, seconded by Councillor Rice, and uh, and Councillor Prince Bay, you'd also have some time now if you want to introduce that to provide any additional thoughts. Lovely, thank you very much, Councillor Nack. I just wanted to say, in hindsight, I think with the previous uh, council committee approvals we just did, we likely should have put that also within the wording. And that's something that I think we can do going forward is to state within existing resources or, or for city council to find, to allocate a resource towards that. That, that is, I believe our responsibility as a, especially going with what we've been doing going through OP12 and asking our administration to go through that. If we are expecting extra work, we should be looking for where to resource that extra work. So that is why I, I propose this amendment. Thank you very much. So uh, we're just uh, discussing the amendment on the floor. Uh, Councillor Wright was on the board. Do you have any questions specifically on the amendment? Um, I, I guess to, to Councillor Principe, uh, because the, the previous reports indicated that resources were available, I don't know if that should be something that's needed going forward. And, and if I can just clarify, you just want to indicate in point one um, that the subcommittee be established within existing resources. Is that the wording? Sorry. Yes, I'll just look to Ms. Jacobson to help me with uh, the wording, how to word it exactly. But yes, it would be for um, item one. Okay. And and then in, in reference to the, while well, Ms. Jacobson is looking at that, um, in reference then to the, the reports going forward that do already indicate the resources are there, do you still think it's necessary? You know, um, 
I, I guess not, but just just if we clarify within existing resources, then I guess it gives it um, a line where where they're not to go past uh, the resources that are available. Okay. Uh, I guess even if they, they see, even if we clarify it's within the existing resources. Okay, then I think I'm agreeable I think it to that. And that's for 2024. Yeah. I, I'm just seeing it in the chat, uh, uh, the rewording. So, yeah, I think I'm on side with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, the updated wording is in the chat. So it would be uh, after the 2024 work plan in point one, the comma within administration's existing resources, and then as you see it remaining there. So uh, we'll continue on with that motion as worded. Uh, Councillor Rutherford has a uh, questions. Yeah, so are we on the amendment? Yes, just on the amendments. Yeah, okay. So I guess what I'm confused about and why I didn't consider it friendly is because by adding the within existing resources, are we talking about what has been outlined in the attachment and in the report? Because in attachment two, it outlines the total average hours projected for 2024 for staffing support as 40 hours with a footnote that says an increase in support hours would result in the addition of a subcommittee. But what we're saying now is go ahead and make that subcommittee and only do these hours. So I, I feel like it's kind of contradictory or, or are we saying within resources allocated to like environmental initiatives? Like th this is to me, they're, they're two different things. So that's why I didn't consider it friendly because I was very confused. If it's, if it's specifically referencing the report in front of us, the report is clear. In order to have the subcommittee, we need more than the 40 hours, correct? So like, I don't want to get it tied, tied in a knot, but I just want to be like, resources can be very vague, like resources within this report, which have already been shored up as not being complete for a subcommittee or resources like the composite profile or, or other things that are like, that's what I'm just trying to, I, you, I want to make it, I want to make sure that it's clear if we're adding that, that we're also not hampering or, or just not being realistic about what is needed to do it. Councillor, I'd suggest to you that if you add within existing resources, you're inviting administration to say with whatever you already have within an existing budget, however you already have a delegated authority. So it's authority. not specific to that report? No, administration within their delegated authority can allocate resources. This is just saying you will get no net new resources for this until we potentially Okay, but it's not specific to this report. It Correct. is, if they want to look at the compass and then they come back with, their, and then as per part two then, they would come back and say, this is how, where we found it within existing resources. Or they would come back and say, we need your approval for this type of a change, whatever okay, the case okay, may be. Okay, okay, that, that helps me clarify. I was just, sorry, I, that's why I didn't consider it friendly because I was just not sure about what we meant when we said resources. So that helps clarify for me. I have no problem with the, the amendment. And, and that was my, my Perfect. intention. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, I see nobody else on the board uh, for questions on the amendment. Uh, anyone wishing to speak to the amendment? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Principe, do you have any closing comments? Uh, no, I, well, I guess I do. I just wanted to say that uh, that was my intention is just within existing resources until we get the report back or memo back, uh, and to see how we can um, where how we can find funds in order to see a subcommittee go through. So uh, thank you very much for that clarification. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Please vote. We are just missing Councillor Jan's vote, but I believe he may have dropped off. Councillor Jan mentioned that they had so to. So, Mr. Chair, would I call point of order? Yes, Councillor Rice, point of order before we close. We are voting uh, amendments right now. Correct, right? just the amendments, yes. And so, can, can we have the amendments, uh, the uh, motion, a proper motion on the floor for us to vote? Because right now it's should the original motion. 
Uh, yes, the the uh, updated wording was in the chat, uh, but uh, so we we should vote on the motion on the floor on the screen and then put proper motion for us to vote. Mm -hmm. We can see if the clerks can update that. Uh, but uh, yeah, the motion is the 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 one that we're voting on is specifically regarding or with the addition of within administration's existing resources being yeah, added. That is, that is uh, amended. Yes, the amendment. Can we put an amendment in motion? Vote the first. I'll check with the clerks. Is that, uh, can you uh, update that wording just so it's clear on the screen for members of council as they're voting? Yes, Councillor Nack, uh, we sure. will have the amendment language on the screen in just a moment. Perfect. Yeah, just hang tight, everyone. We'll get that. Okay, so point of order, should we just recall or not log that vote? The vote has not been completed, so we'll, we'll get the updated wording on the screen and then we'll finish the vote. And apologies, Councillor Nett, can I just get a little bit of clarification from you? We're voting only on the amendment um, moved by Councillor Principe. Correct, and seconded by Councillor Rice, which which was to add the within administration's existing resources. Thank you. So we'll just pull the vote back while we get the updated wording to make it really clear. There it is. Please vote. And with Councillor Jans uh, absent, we have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that is carried. Uh, so we have the updated wording with that change on the floor uh were there any other questions for the overall motion i'll let i'll give folks a moment to click back on councillor uh right we'll clear we'll essentially start on a fresh round here so uh Councilor Wright, go ahead thank you very much i'm just wondering so could those additional resources be the climate change officer to administration um not likely in that a lot of it is um, sort of process. We need FT or people to um, help set up live streaming. It, it would sort of be um, some, uh, you know, uh, additional process resources needed. I think the, the chief climate officer would be actively involved um, with the E-Track committee, but in terms of um, the completion or setup of of those meetings, it most likely wouldn't be solved with the creation of that resource. It would be more of an administrative sort of functional role. Is that right? Okay. Uh, is there any update on the the climate change officer? I I don't think I can provide one. I believe it's okay. all underway, but I wouldn't have an update. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. I don't see any other questions on the board, so we'll uh, go to anyone wishing to speak to the newly amended motion. Councillor Paquette to speak. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Nack. Uh, so, yeah, I, ironically, um, many years ago, I think it was Councillor Walters brought forth a motion uh, that was vaguely similar. And um, uh, I had I voted against it because I said we should look within existing resources, <laughs> and uh, that that passed, um, just as this did. Um, I just feel like history is repeating itself. So I'm obviously happy to support this motion. Um, you know, we've already debated and, and voted on uh, within existing resources as a conversation piece there and as a direction. So I won't belabor that point. But um, I just will say that if uh, we are serious about this, and I believe we are. Uh, we also have to uh, be prepared for the fact that we may not be able to do all this within city resources um, that currently exist. And that is one of the considerations we have to make as we take this issue seriously going forward. So obviously this motion as is has my full support, um, but uh, also I think that it's important to keep in mind that uh, there is not a lot of administration resources left to dedicate to something as important and the body of work as large as this is looking to be. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principe. Thank 
Thank you, Councillor Knack. Um, I just wanted to clarify that my understanding is that within the administration's existing resources is only in the interim. Uh, it's my understanding that once we receive the report back, we will be able to find some resources to make sure that, that this is funded. The, the whole comment about within existing resources is only for the interim, again, looking to see uh, the report back and hopefully through OP12, we'll be able to find funding for this very important um, priority for council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I just wanna say thank you to the Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. I have become very familiar with your faces through the advocacy you've done on so many files throughout 2023. And, uh, you know, definitely want to provide you the resources and support to continue that good work into 2024. Uh, you know, we have talked about how important climate is and, and you know, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is. And, and that discussion and the level it's elevated to wouldn't have happened without this committee. And I think that that's really important to, to acknowledge. I... I absolutely also want to highlight that I think there needs to be a bigger, broader discussion around equity for the advisory committees. I know we've done a lot of work on a governance review, but one of the things that keeps circling in my mind is just how specific skill sets are required for volunteer coordination and advisory committee work that would be different from an area of expertise. And there's two reports that we see at the council meeting today where there are lots of pressures on those areas, including our, our climate group, to do a lot of really great work. And we still need to make time and space for our community voices to influence policy and decision making. So we're gonna have to grapple with that, I think, in a, in a bigger context rather than one-off with each committee, um, and that's something I'm, I'm contemplating for sure. But I really just want to say again, I know I don't I don't sit on committee. I know you have great representation in the councillors that are that are there, uh, but I, I also just really want to acknowledge that we hear you, we appreciate your efforts, and while sometimes we can't move as fast or as hard as you would like us to, that doesn't mean we're not taking to heart what you have, what you are advocating for and what you have brought forward to every place you've been able to, to elevate this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. And to close, Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I too want to begin by thanking um, the, the co-chairs for being with us today and uh, the entire committee for your, your tireless efforts. I know you put so much into this work. And like I said at the outset, it's really challenging work. You know, we we have tasked you with a very ambitious mandate. Um, and when I think about, you know, the, the quality of expertise that's around the table, it is, um, it is incredible. And we see that translated in the memos that we receive as counselors and the advice that you provide to us, uh, whether it's at budget or for specific items that are coming to committee. Uh, it is really appreciated and really integral to being able to fulfill the goals that are set out in the energy transition strategy. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the discussion we had today. I, I think it's such an important one. Um, given the mandate that you've been been tasked with, we need to ensure that we're setting you up for success. Um, and not just the, the committee, but setting administration up for success as well to be able to support the committee. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to moving forward with the motion that is outlined in front of us so that we can give you the surety you need that you'll be able to, um, to start work on that, that subcommittee structure uh, with a broader conversation coming up about how we can make sure that that is um, sustainable sustainable and resourced in a good way uh, so that that work can be carried out going forward. Um, so again, my, my gratitude to all the committee members and, and my council colleagues for um, bearing with me as we worked through this motion today, uh, but looking forward to the work ahead and, um, and all the excellent things that are uh, on the agenda for 2024 in front of you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Please, or, uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Thank you. Please display the votes. And that motion is carried and I will return the chair. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Knack. Um, great. Well, and, and thank you uh, to Maya and Jacob for being with us today. Uh, we will now move on to our next committee. Thanks so much. Okay, so next up is the naming committee. Uh, so I, I see Aaron. Um, hi, Aaron. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Good. How are nice, you? Nice to see you. Um, so yeah, we have some uh, time, of course, for you to present. Do you have a presentation uh, that we can get up on the screen or just verbal? Oh, it will be just verbal. Sure. We do not have an additional slide deck. Okay, sounds good. Please go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen of City Council, I'm honored to present the naming committee's accomplishments for the year of 2023 and our forward-looking plan for 2024. Last year, our dedicated team achieved significant milestones, which we believe reflect our city's rich heritage, as well as the multicultural identity. Through our inclusive naming practices, we've aimed to celebrate local heroes, recognize our Indigenous roots, and contribute to Edmonton's evolving urban landscape. Specifically, we successfully named new trails, parks, roads, and municipal facilities with names that embody our values of respect, diversity, and inclusivity. A highlight includes the naming of the Amiskwachi Amiskwahina Trail, which symbolizes our commitment to acknowledging our Indigenous history and ensuring it remains a vital part of our city's identity. Looking forward, the naming committee has outlined specific priorities to continue enhancing our city's landscape with meaningful names that reflect our community's values. This work plan includes the continued implementation of the policy to action plan. Following our presentation to the Urban Planning Committee on October 11th, 2023, we are committed to implementing the eight recommendations. These recommendations aim to refine our naming processes, ensuring that they are inclusive efficient and reflective of that diverse tapestry. We aim to engage in community engagement and participate in any renaming initiatives that come our way. You'll remember the OCL's application to rename their neighborhood to Wikwentowin was unanimously supported by the committee and subsequently passed by council. We believe this process reflects our dedication to engaging with communities directly and supporting their identities through the naming process, rather than applying a name that we believe is most suitable. We will continue to prioritize such community-led renaming applications and will commit to working closely with stakeholders to ensure that process is both transparent and inclusive. Tomorrow, I will present our committee recruitment and we are aiming to increase our diversification. We conducted a skills assessment of all returning members and identified areas where new members could contribute to more diverse discussions. We evaluated 17 applications and we are aiming to recruit members who can bring these varied insights to our work. I'm very excited about the candidates as they indicate a new level of interest and passion for naming in the city from all corners. These priorities underscore our commitment to making Edmonton the most inclusive and welcoming city we can. By focusing on these areas, we do anticipate making strides in 2024 with a thoughtfully named urban environment. We continue to be well supported by our administrative liaison, Corey Sousa, and we look forward to our ongoing positive working relationship as we transition to our incoming chair, Matthew Dance. As this will be my final report to council as chair, I am timing out. I've reached my maximum term. I want to thank you for the continued support of our efforts. We look forward to another year of progress and contributions to our city's identity and heritage. I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm just trying to, who selected this one? I think it was also Councillor Knack. 
Uh, but I'm sensing a trend here, so I'm going to go to Councillor Stevenson uh, to kick us off with questions. Thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, want to thank you in particular for the incredible work you've done over your your term. And uh, you know, I've I've seen such a shift, um, or, or you know, such a such a um, great alignment between the work of the naming committee and and the council's strategic priorities. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you also most recently for your role in the renaming of We Quentowin. I think that was a, a really exceptional uh, initiative in our community and appreciate the, the role that the naming committee played in that. So I wanted to talk a, a little bit about sort of some of the proactive work on the legacy names uh, that, that you've outlined. Could you tell me a little bit more about, about what that looks like? Um, is it... Uh, is it engaging with different uh, communities? Is it um, coming up with recommendations? Just, yeah, just some thoughts about what, what that maybe looks like. So at this point, we are doing our best to evaluate the existing names that are within the registry. So that would be any named asset uh, of the city. And we are striving to identify any that may present problems. Now, this is... Uh, quite a big in, uh, initiative, and my successor, Matthew Dance, is very skilled in information analysis and making data-based decisions. So I would defer to him for the precise action items and methodologies that we're going to take to do that, but it is intended to look more at the data than a direct engagement with community. However, should a community present itself that wishes to engage in a process like the OCL process, um, that is something that we are very open to. At this point with our current capacity, we're not able to go out and seek that proactively from community members at this point. Um, that would require additional resources that we have not requested. Great. And I think, I think maybe just to clarify, you know, I'd understood... Um, that you know, part of that work is reviewing the data and then sort of identifying um, names that you know could potentially cause harm. And it's it's more that question of how are we defining harm? What are the principles around that? And I and I wonder if there's a f first step around. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I think the data analysis in terms of you know I don't have a sense in terms of what proportion of our named assets include people, for example, historical figures, and then. From that, just sort of what what is the yeah what are the parameters going to be around identifying uh, names? I think that you you suggested maybe are problematic, um, and when I I think that something that was really powerful about the OCL process is that it was really you know community writ large that said this name is a source of harm. This is this is a challenge. So just wondering again, who's kind of defining that harm? Uh, and what principles will the committee use in, in undertaking that data analysis work? I will be honest and say I don't have a full sense of the scope of that work. However, I do believe that as a natural outcome of our conversations that will be part of the city centre, government centre LRT renaming, as it was once Grandin Government Centre, that I believe through that process, there will be an opportunity to identify what harm means in at least the context of that community, which could be valuable, informative practice for going forward. With our resources, I think our best option is to utilize the existing processes that are happening in the city to help us define what our processes will do. In this case, I would like to defer back to more subject matter experts on what is harm before I make a statement on how we will define it. Yeah, and I, and I wonder too if there's space for um, recognizing that, you know, I think part of this work is just sort of reflecting on, on alignment or, or more fulsome understanding of history I think I think you know there's maybe also just focusing on that the the positive side of things in terms of how 
I'm sort of speaking to it at this point, but just wondering if, um, so there, there will be some work at the outset in terms of setting out some of those parameters to, to support the work and ensure that it is, you know, an, an inclusive process of all voices that, that may be engaged in this. That is one of the most critical pieces is my understanding from the board's current makeup and members is that these are decisions we do not feel that we are empowered to make without community. Yes, we have the authority to do so. However, the moral authority, I don't think we have. And especially with our current makeup of members, we do not reflect the diversity of Edmonton. And therefore, we're very conscientious about what blanket statements we make. We have focused more on the specific cases and looked at what the community is telling us directly. So in the case of other areas that may be names that are causing harm, I would very much welcome those that feedback if, if there are no names in the community, but barring that, we'll conduct our analysis and, and try to identify that from our perspective. And then we want to validate that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, so I'm not seeing anyone else on the board for uh, for questions, but we do have a recommendation. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, would you like to put that on? Yes, happy to. Um, so I will move that uh, the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 02284 be received for information. And I could briefly introduce it. And I'll second that. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, just really, really want to reiterate uh, what what exceptional work I think the naming committee is doing. Um, it's it's been very heartening to see how that's played out in community and, and just the work that, the ongoing work that you're doing to ensure that, um, that Edmonton's names and placemaking reflect our full history and, and our community as it is today. I think uh, this has been a, a, a good conversation this afternoon um, because I think there are some, I, I think what's been really powerful about the work that's happened so far is that it has been very community driven. Uh, it's, it's been a grassroots initiative around the naming of the wards, for example. Uh, we Quenta win, I think, is another great example. And, and I think that what I'm hearing the intent of the naming committee today is to be sort of like setting setting out the, the data and the information that that community more broadly can then run with. I think that's a really great role for the committee to be playing rather than being the arbiters of of good taste or, or what, what the right names are, um, more to just inform Edmontonians and empower them to then make those those changes um, themselves. So w with support and with with uh, input from from the committee as well. Uh, so I think I think um, that is why I am supportive of the work plan as it's presented and why I put this motion on the floor. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm not seeing anyone else on the board. Um, <laughs> should we count that as your introduction and closing, Councillor Stevenson? Yes. Unless other, Unless other folks would like to speak to this, which I'm not seeing. Great. Um, let's vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Excellent, that is carried. Uh, well, thank you so much, Erin. Um, I really appreciate all the work that you and the committee do and looking forward to the work ahead over 2024. Take care. And next up we have the Edmonton Historical Board. Um, and we have uh, Harrison and Cheryl joining us, I believe. Uh, oh, and Omar. Hello. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Uh, Excellent. So we'll hand the floor over to you folks for a brief presentation. We have your slide deck up in front of us, and um, that will be followed up by some questions from Council. Please go ahead. 
Great. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Uh, good afternoon, City Council. My name is Harrison Charmada, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Steve Reese, our chair, and Shailene Williams, our vice chair, uh, both of the Edmonton Historical Board. They were both unable to make it today, so I am here in their steads. And I should also clarify that I'm listed on the report as a vice chair, but that's actually not my official role until the next term of the board starts in May. And I'll, you'll also be seeing me here tomorrow uh, for the board recruitment item at the Community and Public Services Committee. So as you likely know, our board is made up of 10 members from a variety of backgrounds, and we're happily supported uh, by city staff from the Arts, Heritage, and Natural Experiences and Urban Strategies sections, as well as this term city council liaison, Councillor Stevenson. We also had the privilege of working with our first co-historians laureate uh, for the historical board, Cheryl Whiskeyjack and Omar Yacoub. Our mandate uh, for the board is to provide advice to council regarding matters relating to city of Edmonton historical issues and civic heritage policies, and encourage and promote the preservation and safeguarding of historical properties, resources, communities, and documentary heritage. We have four subcommittees that perform the majority of work related to that mandate, the Historical Resource Review Panel, the Historic Plaques Committee, the Policy and Planning Committee, and the Engagement Committee. And in addition to our own subcommittees, one member of the board every term is appointed to sit on the naming committee. Uh, next slide, please. We have had many accomplishments uh, from the previous year. Uh, as you can see on the slide, we've had six nominations to the Inventory of Historic Resources in Edmonton by the Historical Resources Review Panel. And all six were unanimously approved and added to the inventory. So you can see the list here, the Scheutz residence, Montague residence, the Combe residence, Greaseball Barracks Physical Training Building, the Elizabeth Bell residence, and the Burley Brown Cottage. Next slide, please. Eight buildings uh, were already listed on the inventory, were designated as municipal historic resources with the protections that follow that over this last term as well. And you can see here those eight buildings. So we have the McGrath Mansion, the Boardwalk Building, the Revlon Building, and we have five uh, buildings in Horlock Park, the main pavilion, the boathouse, and three picnic shelters. So quite, quite good in terms of adding to our existing inventory as well as protecting existing um, buildings inventory through designation. Next slide, please. The Heritage and Climate Change Achieving Climate Goals in Edmonton Report was produced by our policy and planning subcommittee. This report was subsequently shared with council and it's also available uh, for public viewing on our EHB website. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the board also held its first in-person plaques presentation event uh, since COVID last July, where we had over 60 people attend at the historic Pendennis building downtown on Jasper Avenue. This uh, is the board's premier event of the year and one that we want to continue to grow into the future. Unfortunately, during COVID, we weren't able to have an in-person event for our plaques presentations. Next, I want to introduce our three goals and work plan for 2024. So all three goals and the related actions will continue to advance our mandate to council. Uh, the first goal is advising council on historic resources that should be added to the inventory, as well as building greater awareness of city of Edmonton historical issues and civic heritage policies while communicating about emergent issues and priorities with council. Actions related to this goal are scheduling and attending regular meetings with councillors, communicating and meeting informally with the designated EHB council liaison, and continuing to send advisory letters to council, which you likely uh, received a few from us over the past couple of years. Our second goal is supporting the preservation and promotion of built heritage in Edmonton. Some actions to support this are making recommendations to city council on additions to the inventory of historic resources to better preserve Edmonton's historic resources, review applications, submissions, or conduct independent research to identify historic resources to be considered for inclusion on the inventory, and collaborating with owners of buildings being considered for or added to the inventory. And our third goal is promoting Edmonton's history. Actions to support this are overseeing the work to write and install the historic plaques through our historic plaques committee, coordinating annual historic plaque ceremony events. And since we've started, we've had 46. It's going back many, many decades. Another action is overseeing and updating the award-winning Edmonton's Architectural Heritage website, which is a responsibility of the Historic Plaques Committee. Uh, and that website provides local historical information for Edmontonians, Canadians, and international online visitors. And we've received people from all over the world actually looking at this website, so it's had a lot of traction. Another action is supporting Edmonton's Historian Laureate Program, which was actually the first of its kind for Canadian municipality. And the last action is ensuring continued dialogue with our historian laureates and the community through social media platforms. 
And that is all I have for today. Thank you very much. And I'm here to ask any, answer any questions you may have. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the overview presentation. Um, we'll now go to the board for questions. Well, thank you. Oh, I'm not. I'm going to assume Councillor Stevenson's on the board, um, but I can't quite see it. Why don't we go? Why don't we go to you, Councillor Stevenson? Anyways, sure. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the the presentation overview, and maybe um, just wanted to offer a, a bit of my time to to Omar. Um, if you had any thoughts and reflections on your experience as, as the historian laureate or co-historian laureate that you wish to share with uh, council and committee. I, th I think Cheryl and I are coming up in a minute, but we can move ours ahead. Oh, maybe just to clarify, um, are there more slides? There may not be more of a presentation in terms of slides. However, with this board, you usually do hear from the committee and then from the laureates as well. Oh, okay. So you can ask questions or hear from everyone. Sure. If it's okay with you, Councillor Stevenson, maybe we can um, pass the floor over to uh, Cheryl and Omar for uh, some comments. Excellent. Why don't we? Why don't we do that? Um, Omar, please go ahead. Okay. Tanse salam. Greetings, everyone. I'm going to actually turn it over to Cheryl and a little bit about what we've been up to. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for making time for us today to present. Um, Omar and I uh, came together to tell a better story to assert the importance of Indigenous history and reconciliation and to bring this into the story of how we become people to Edmonton. This is how we came together um, as co-historian laureates was to be able to tell that story together. It gave us the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, Cheryl and I have had the opportunity to work together for a number of years before becoming historian co-laureates. We started out by welcoming people at the airport, uh, telling a different story about what a rival in Edmonton could look like. Uh, it's something that gave me goosebumps is that someone's first impression of the city would be being greeted with traditional song and dance and how that told a different story of Edmonton. And one of the unfortunate things that happens is many newcomers, when they come to Edmonton, they pick up on negative stereotypes about Indigenous people. Even before they learn the language, they recognize that a certain group is less desirable. And how do we counter that? How do we address that? That comes through the shared storytelling comes through the incredible work Cheryl and Ben Arrow has been doing. As historian co-laureates, some of the really exciting things we've had the opportunity to do is to help different people see their stories as settlers, uh, to put together a prayer book on prayers for the land and its people. Imagine what a traditional form of prayer could look like as land greetings or land acknowledgements to reimagine what the Treaty 6 medallion could look like from the eyes of young people. Um, and it's been really, really incredible. Uh, that was year one. In year one, we had an opportunity to, uh, to do speaking engagements with Edmonton Public Libraries, with McEwen, with Norquest, uh, with a number of different, different agencies and organizations throughout the city. We had the opportunity to do the Treaty 6 Medallion remix, to do a festival called Roots on Six, which brought together uh, World Refugee Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, to build on culture days and opportunity that Bent Arrow leads to welcome people into Indigenous culture, uh, to also work on plaque development with schools and poets and community. And as part of year two, one of the things that Cheryl and I have been working on is a threaded mural that connects a number of buildings in the city, that connects the Africa Center, Bent Arrow, MCC Thrift, and the Islamic Family Hub uh, through two muralists in our city, uh, Jamel Davies and Rahman Hamid. Um, they have been working with us, engaging community to imagine what different people's stories on Treaty 6 looks like, and then to visualize that together. Those murals will be dropping relatively soon, this spring, this summer, hopefully, and we're really excited to share that with you. We're also really excited to be sharing that there's a podcast coming out, which is talking about big questions through old wisdom. Um, and details of that are dropping 
very, very shortly. We also have some stickers to show off and hopefully all of you will be getting some. Um, this has been a fantastic opportunity. Thank you. Back to you, Cheryl. Thanks, Omar. Um, so as Omar mentioned, we've been working together for many years prior to this opportunity. And I imagine we'll be working together long after this um, because it's just really helped us develop our relationship even further. Um, Omar gets Omar and his community um, and his colleagues in his community get access to um, Bentera and all the things that we do culturally here in the city, and we get access to newcomers by working through Omar and uh, all of the folks that he brings us in connection with. And what we've learned is that helping diverse settler communities to see their part in reconciliation, um, see their shared stories is the key to building a better city. Our shared stories and intertwined history is teaching us about how to build better housing, make neighborhoods safer, and help people belong. I want to leave you with a story about the lobstick. Um, I learned this story from Jacqueline Cardinal, um, and she learned it from her father, Louis Cardinal, by spending time with him out in the land. Um, it's a story about how we did wayfinding way back in the day um, here on this land, and our highways were the river. Uh, the river um, had many bends and twists and turns, as we all know, and lobsticks were um, trees typically lodgepole pines that were uh, along the river and Indigenous people would cut these lob sticks to wayfind for people who were traveling through the same same path. So if you could picture a tall lodge pine, maybe the, the, the whole bottom would be shaved off and only the top would be looking like a tree or maybe the middle would be cut off. And so obviously nature didn't make the tree that way. So the traveler on the river would be able to use the, the lobstick to find its way. And at every lobstick was also a, a cache at the bottom of it. And the cache would help people um, who were traveling behind them. If I had extra pemmican on my travels, I would leave this pemmican in the cache. Um, if I knew something along my travels that could help another traveler traveling the same route, I would leave evidence of that in the cache, maybe a story or a note um, that would help a fellow traveler. So these lobsticks were there to help um, me, uh, potentially from a traveler who came before me, but also to help travelers um, coming up behind. Um, so they used to be a part of our river valley and a maker to the travelers that this was a place to stop and find support. And I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to share stories and hope that our legacy is to develop lobsticks signaling safety and home here um, by leaving these stories behind um, in the way that lobsticks were informing travelers and settlers um, in, in years previous to us. Um, I really love that story because uh, it just signifies a way that we built community back then and brings that into the present um, with the activities that Omar and, a, Omar and I and our organizations that we brought together have been able to do today. Anything else, Omar? Oh, thank you. And thank you. Uh, thank you to the Heritage Board and Council for this opportunity. It's been wonderful. Thank you both so much. Uh, really appreciated your 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 words today and um, and sharing those stories. Um, I'll have a few questions, but I'll go to Councillor Stevenson first. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful story, and I love love the meaning behind that in terms of um, you know getting the support that we need while also leaving leaving uh, behind for others to follow. So thank you so much for that, and thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, throughout the year, I um, just wanted to circle back with with the um, historical board directly. So thank you, thank you so much for uh, the work and and the report. Um, maybe just wondering uh, a few of the things that were um, highlighted. So just in terms of the subcommittees that you've outlined, um, it seems like those are very much sort of working committees that they are, uh, you know, producing, producing specific things rather than sort of a governance or, or advisory side? Yeah, that's where the bulk of our work comes from are those uh, subcommittees. Great. And so, again, 
maybe just two to our administration in terms of, um, so if a lot of the work that's happening, again, I'm just struggling with the, the, the legislative requirements around them being public meetings, recognizing that these are sort of very much hands-on um, type, type of uh, committees. There's no, no allowance for that in the legislation, is there? There's, they're still sort of considered official subcommittees that. Yes, anytime they're doing work that advances the committee and any decision making, these committees can't delegate any of their decision making authority. So the subcommittees are to do work, to do research, to prepare things, and then everything comes back up to the committee. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly it really is reflective of the volunteer commitment and the, the amount of sort of work that's produced through, the, through those committees. Just a question around, um, you know, there was conversation about um, some work around continuing to build the relationship with the Edmonton Heritage Council, uh, also with the um, Edmonton District Historical Society, I believe. So just wondering if you could touch on that a little bit about what that initiative could look like. Yeah, there's been some chatter about kind of merging, I think, more specifically, EHC and EHB potentially, uh, just because we're all kind of in the same realm of heritage, preservation, celebration in Edmonton. So there's definitely some shared interests there between uh, EHC and EHB. There hasn't been a, as much discussions, as far as I'm aware, with the Edmonton District Historical Society and EHB. It's more so with EHC, but we do have pretty regular communications with EHC, uh, with their group, just to kind of see what they're working on, uh, kind of sh information sharing, seems any areas we can collaborate. Uh, but definitely, like, if you look at other municipalities, there's some more frameworks for heritage organizations. Uh, if there's, like, maybe one main body that manages heritage, there's sometimes a few, like, like with here. Uh, but I think there is some shared interest. And there definitely could be some potential efficiencies with collaborating. But again, uh, a lot up to discussion uh, in the future. Great, great. Well, yeah, glad to hear those conversations are ongoing. I think, you know, I see see a lot of potential for that that alignment. Um, and, you know, I, again, potential merger with EH, uh, Edmonton H Heritage Council and Edmonton Historical Board. So thanks, thanks for that. Just looking at attachment two, and I'm sorry to, to dive into the weeds. Um, so just looking at the human resources, so this is on the last page. So it mentions sort of a 0.9 uh, full-time position uh, to support the uh, the committee is that just to clarify is that the so it, it says that the historical board is also routinely supported by the city archivist and members of the heritage planning unit so is that the cumulative number of hours of all of those individuals or it's 0.9 with the coordinator plus additional support from the city archivist and the heritage planning unit <laughs> Yes, it's it's uh, combined with the coordinator, heritage planning unit, and the archivist's hours. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. That that helps clarify for me. Um, perfect. I think that that those are all the questions I had. Um, thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Prince Pay now. Thank you, Chair Salvador. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to be asking seeing the same kind of questions that Councillor Stevenson was asking about your work with the uh, Edmonton Heritage Council. I know that um, one of their, their strategic priorities or strategic goals, it states to review historian laureate program and mandate for cultural inclusion. So I understand, Mr. Sharameta, that you have been working with Edmonton Heritage Council as well, yes? Yeah, not 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 in depth. We've had we kind of have regular check ins every few months just to kind of see where things are at with them uh, to see what projects they're currently working on, tell them what we're working on, see if there's anywhere any ways we can collaborate. But we aren't we aren't currently working on any projects together per se. We still have separate mandates. Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. And then I would like to check with um with our other guests here, uh, Cheryl and Omar. Thank you. Yeah, very much for sharing your story. It was fantastic. Really nice to hear it's kind of a nice nice story for us to hear today thank you very much uh how how do you find um with edmonton heritage council have they been including you in in your work as historian laureate have, 
So, oh, uh, no, I was I was just going to say throughout um, our uh, couple of years, we've um, I- I'm getting confused between the two. Um, we've been invited to regular meetings throughout our term. Um, to prevent present updates, much like today, on the work that we've been doing. Um, also offers of support, if there's anything that they could do for us. And uh, there were certainly things that, you know, in presenting our updates that they went, oh, that's definitely something we can help you with. Let us follow up on that. And so that's been our experience for the past over uh, almost two years. Okay, yeah. okay. Catherine, Ivany, uh, and others have been tremendous supports, opening doors for us when we're um, trying to find access things or trying to figure out what's happening in the archive or whatnot. So it's been a fantastic experience on that side. Yeah. Even like things we didn't even know we could get support on. They, right. They, yeah. Excellent. That's great. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Chair Salvador. Thanks, Councillor Principe. Um, Councillor Knack, could you take the chair? I've got the chair. Thank I've got the chair. There we go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just had a, a few questions for um, Omar and Cheryl. So am I correct in understanding that it's two-year term, right? So you're coming up on on the end yeah. of yours, right? That's right. Okay, well, thank you so much for your service. Um, I, I guess I would like some reflections just around the co-historian laureate model. Uh, I was looking back to, I think, 20, 2010. Um, and are you the first co-historian laureates? Yeah, so you, you kind of alluded to it, but I guess just the opportunities for um, cross-cultural learning and, and support. Uh, do you think that that is a good model going forward to have two people in this role? I think it is, um, but <laughs> to Omar's point, um, we were already working together uh, prior to this. So it was really a natural extension of work that we had, really natural extension of work we had already been doing. Um, so I think um, if you were going to consider that, um, that would be something to look for if there was a like a pre-existing sort of relationship where this, this opportunity was for them to continue to do that work. Um, Cause that certainly was the case for us. Yeah, I would agree. I wouldn't say that it has to be a, a, a shared role because there, there may be individuals who really excel, have very clear ideas. You know, from the onset, Cheryl and I knew that we wanted to work together, that it would be m- way more exciting for us to do this together than it would be for us to do it apart. Great. That's that's really good feedback. I appreciate that. And um yeah, it just sounds like you have so much on the go and um, looking forward to the podcast, the stickers, the the murals. That sounds amazing. Um, so, yeah, again, just just my gratitude. So um, I'm not seeing anyone else on the board. Um, Councillor Stevenson, did you move the <laughs> would you like to move the recommendation? Yes, thank you. Happy to move that. The Edmonton Historical Board's request to establish four subcommittees for the 2024 work plan as included in Attachment 3 of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02277, be approved. And I'll second that. Great. Um, Would you like to introduce? Okay. Uh, So I'll just look to the board if there's anyone who uh, has any further questions or would like to speak to this. Great. Uh, Councillor Stevenson, would you like to close? Sure, just very briefly, uh, want to share my appreciation and thanks for all the members of the historical board and, and the work that they do. And, and of course, our outgoing uh, historian laureates. I think your work has really enriched our community and uh, you know planted so many seeds that will continue to grow far past uh, your, your tenure uh, in this position. So thank you both so much for that. Um, you know, the, the historical board, does a lot of very important work in terms of um, highlighting our past, telling telling the stories of our past, and preserving um, some of the remnants of that past through our built heritage. So very grateful for the work that the volunteers do. Um, this is a, a group that um, provides 
you know, I would say beyond advisory advice, they provide actual work and output um, that, that makes its way directly into our community through, through plaques and, and a range of other uh, initiatives. So thank you so much for the work that they do. Um, I'm, I'm excited for the ongoing conversations in terms of, um, you know, that alignment and integration with uh, the Heritage Council, just seeing how that could potentially unfold. Um, looking forward to, to further conversations about how we strengthen uh, and amplify the great work um, that is happening in our city around our history and our heritage. So thank you again so much to everyone who's involved on the board and I encourage my colleagues to support the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Great, uh, well, Omar, Cheryl, Harrison, thank you so much for being with us today um, and for your contributions uh, and service to our city. Really appreciate it. Okay, take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks. All right, so uh, at this time, uh, we have <laughs> three more committees uh, to hear from, but it is our dinner break, and I'm just gonna look to the clerk. We're gonna be hearing from uh, the Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton Committee uh, right after dinner, is that correct? At 6 p.m.? Wonderful, I'm seeing nodding heads. Uh, great, so we will pause here, colleagues, uh, and resume at six. Thanks so much.
And we are live in council chamber. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I will call this meeting back to order and start with a roll call. Councillor Wright? Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Knack? Good evening. Good evening. Councillor Principe? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Councillor Stevenson? Good evening. Good evening. And Councillor Paquette? Hey. Hi there. Councillor Tang? don't think is with us. Um, and yeah, Mayor Sohi uh, is unable to join us. Councillor Hamilton? Also not with us. Uh, Councillor Rutherford? Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here. Councillor Cartmel? Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Councillor Rice? Good evening. Good evening. And Councillor Jans? Don't think Councillor Jans is able to join us. Um, okay, great. So uh, we'll resume right where we left off. So we were just going to hear from uh, the Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton Committee, and I believe we have um, Ariza with us. Hi, yes. how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so we have some time allocated to, to hear from you, of course. Do you have a um, slide deck or presentation? Oh, there it is in front of us. Okay, perfect. So we'll hand the floor over to you and then we'll follow that up with some questions. For sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, I hope you all had a really good dinner break with some yummy food. Uh, my name is Ariza Jiwa and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton. Before we get started, I wanted to share that I'm appearing before you today in my personal capacity as co-chair of WAVE and not in my professional capacity as one of the solicitor lawyers for the city of Edmonton. Not able to be with me today is my co-chair, Julianne Threlfall, but she was definitely instrumental in the work leading up to today and it joining me tomorrow's membership report to the Public Services Committee. First and foremost, we wanted to thank Edmonton City Council and administration for continuing to recognize the importance of diverse voices within our community and providing us with the platform to advocate for the needs and concerns of women and gender diverse people. It is an honor to contribute to the dialogue surrounding key issues that impact our community and we are committed to fostering positive change. Next slide, please. WAVE has three guiding principles in how we moved through 2023 and how we aim to move forward for 2024. As you can see, WAVE's mandate includes A, providing recommendations to you about women's gender-based issues and opportunities in relation to policies, priorities, and decisions that come your way. B, promoting leadership development to empower Edmonton women to fully participate in, in civic life. And C, researching and providing information and resources about gender-based issues and opportunities in Edmonton. In 2023, WAVE did a fantastic job of interweaving our mandate into every decision and step that was taken by WAVE. Next slide, please. Our success is significantly linked to the dedication and expertise of the amazing women and gender diverse people on our committee. Their passion, insights, and commitment to the betterment of our community is invaluable. You can see some of our current and past members in this picture here, and we currently have 15 members with three subcommittees. Our councillor advisors, Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Wright, enrich our understanding of council decisions and their insights are invaluable in guiding us through complexities of governance. We are supported by an administrative li li liaison in community services, Christine Causing, who not only helps us advance our work, but also ensures our organizational efficiency. 
We are supported by Parados, who has been significantly helpful in increasing Wave's presence in the community, allowing Edmontonians to share their ideas and concerns with us. We are fantastic for this. We are grateful for this fantastic team. We are currently in an active recruitment cycle, which a few of you will hear about more tomorrow. Right now, we are operating on a one-year pilot co-chair model, which was voted on by our members in November 2023. Thus far, it is showing great strength in bringing a renewed direction and energy to leadership and the committee as a whole. Next slide, please. Looking back to 2023, WAVE has accomplished many of our priorities. Our 2023 priorities included advocacy, intersectionality, reconciliation, anti-racism, and equity, and lastly, empowering women to get involved in different ways with municipal government. Next slide, please. To achieve these priorities, WAVE's first goal was to empower, educate, mob and mobilize women and gender diverse people in Edmonton, in the Edmonton community through execution of policy-based initiatives. WAVE did this through briefing notes and letters directly to council respecting affordable housing, affor uh, houselessness, women's in and safety in public spaces, spaces, working together with Vehicle for Hire and ensuring those policies accounted for women and gender diverse people. We also collaborated with Parity Yeg on their policy competition, and WAVE also created a website to provide this information to Edmontonians and an avenue for them to share their thoughts with us. Next slide. WAVE's second goal was to empower, educate, and mobilize women and gender diverse people in the Edmonton community through execution, execution of initiatives that align with WAVE's priorities. As many of you may be familiar with, WAVE implemented this goal through our Equity in Motion panel series. These events were hosted at the YWCA and Amy in Edmonton. They have all been live streamed and recorded for full accessibility for all Edmontonians. In 2023, we've had wonderful panelists like MLA Janice Irwin, Dr. Anya Ulrich, Melanie Bailey, Stephanie Anders, and Funke Olukude. Episode one focused on women and gender diverse people in governance. Episode two focused on women and gender diverse people in STEM and academia. We had the chance to collaborate with many of you, including Mayor Sohi, Councillor Wright, and Councillor Rutherford, and we are extremely grateful for that support. Next slide. WAVE's third goal in 2023 was to ensure that reconciliation is the responsibility of the whole WAVE committee and that the WAVE plan will direct, create, and create curriculum content for committee's reconciliation moments in general meetings. For WAVE, this included personalized land acknowledgements, Indigenous learning moments, and sharing at every meeting, multiple indi Indigenous training for WAVE members, a reconciliation subcommittee discussing systemic changes, and intentional recruitment of Indigenous members to join WAVE. We've worked alongside Indigenous Relations Offices, the Indigenous Relations Office, and other Indigenous organizations to share that recruitment posting. The examples shared today in today's presentation are only a portion of the work completed by WAVE in reaching all three of our goals. This presentation would go on for hours if I outlined it all. Next slide, please. As we move forward in the coming year, we are eager to witness the growth and progress that will undoubtedly result from our collective efforts. The diversity of perspectives within our advisory committee reflects the richness of our community, and we are confident that our collaboration will contribute to a more inclusive and equitable city. WAVE's 2024 work plan includes three overarching goals. Our first goal is to advocate to you all on critical issues affecting women and gender diverse people. Our second goal is to improve the quality of life for women and gender diverse people in a Miskwachi Waskaihigan. Our third goal is to empower women and gender diverse people to get involved in different ways in municipal government. We have outlined the steps and action items for each of these goals in our annual report package provided to you. Our work plan was worked on by our whole committee through a full day strategic planning day. Since submitting it earlier this year, we have fine tuned the wording a bit. The essence remains the same with our outlined goals and the action items have been made more clear. We are well on our way to approving our 2024 to 2026 strategic plan at our next monthly meeting. I want to take this time to further elaborate on our first goal. 
Our goal one is to advocate to you all on the critical issues affecting women and gender diverse people. This is the priority that we've requested a subcommittee for. Effectively, this subcommittee would be able to assist the larger committee with reviewing and advising on bylaws and policies being discussed by City Council that are relevant to WAVE's mandate. We hope this will continue our path of open communication between WAVE members and Council as we are all working towards a better Edmonton. Having dedicated, having a dedicated subcommittee for this work can allow for proper processes to be created, efficient drafting on briefing notes, and a higher cap time capacity for providing briefing notes to you all within very fast timelines. Having this subcommittee ensures that WAVE's voice is heard and that WAVE's perspectives are provided to City Council directly and often. This is a crucial component to municipal, gov municipal government decisions, and WAVE does not take this lightly. Next slide, please. We want to express our appreciation for the opportunity to advise City Council as an advisory board. We appreciate the ongoing collaboration and support we've received, and we are excited about the possibilities that lie ahead and the potential for pos positive change. We value the collaboration with our fellow, fellow City Council advisors and City Count Edmonton administration and cannot emphasize enough that our success depends on the amazing women and gender diverse people in our committee. Today, we can create a more inclusive, equitable and thriving city for all. Thank you all for your time and allowing me this opportunity to share our updates with you. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much for the um, really excellent and thorough overview. Uh, I am gonna go to Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you, Arisa. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I just, I do have some questions. Um, so I know you had the, the three different committees, uh, sorry, subcommittees. Um, and I think, I think you've woven the reconciliation, I think, throughout the meetings and that. So is that sort of one of the reasons why you've decided to, to back off on, on that subcommittee or? Yeah, so um, we heard the concerns from council and administration about the limitations of having our full um, group of subcommittees moving forward. So we heard that concern. Um, we understand that it's extra resources and extra time that the city might not have. So to balance this request and to ensure that we're staying true to our uh, mandate, we went with the one subcommittee. So okay. the reconciliation component, we have woven, woven it between every um, goal of our strategic plan. So instead of it only being directed within like, let's say one third of our uh, mandate, it is part of the whole mandate. So that's where that one went. Um, it was a hesitant approach that WAVE took in relation to the subcommittees because a lot of great work happens in our subcommittees. Um, so if there is the opportunity to have more in the future, or if there's the opportunity to come back to council to re request more than the one that we have, that would be amazing. Um, but we really did listen to what uh, the advice was from everyone around us. And, and we went with one that um, aligned most with WAVE's mandate and being able to provide that advice to you all about what um, gender um, what women and gender diverse issues are coming up. Okay, and, and that that's awesome. And I think you do need the, the, the time to do that work in a subcommittee, especially when um, some of the requests come at you to, to provide those quick turnaround times. So I do appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm gonna follow up with admin, just um, may, maybe I'll just quickly ask, um, cause Ms. Jacobson, are you still there this evening? I am. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, they, they've really done some great work with the Equity in Motion um, series that they had. And so if they still needed to, to organize events like that, that can be done without a subcommittee, right? I mean, if somebody's just going to go off and book a place or or book some panelists, that doesn't, and then bring it back for approval to the to the board, that would be okay? That work sounds like things that can be done outside of a meeting, yes. Okay, perfect, great. I just wanted to check on that. Okay, and then so, uh, Arisa, back back to you. Um, I, I just noticed the consulting and uh, professional costs. Um, Sounds good. I'll pull up my budget. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't in it wasn't in the twenty twenty three budget, but the actual costs were thirty six thousand. 
And now we've dropped it down for 2024 to be 5,000. I'm just wondering what that was. Yeah, for sure. So um, thank you to our administration. Um, Christine Causing provided me with additional information on where that was, that money was spent in 2023 and why it's different for 2024. So um, for 2023, that was spent on Paradox's out-of-scope communications and social media work. So it's video filming and Waves communication plan, as well as the rebranding of Waves logo. Um, this also included other social media support prior to having Paradox as our main team. And it also included admin and AV support during our meetings. So because um, our communication plan and social media work and um, our WAVE logo has already been done. It's something that we can check off the list. It's not something that we project being a cost for 2024. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay. And then did, did they also, they helped broadcast on social media some of the um, equity in motion sessions? Is that right? Yeah. So all our, um, A, they're live, um, live streamed, but also recorded and accessible uh, to this day of all the past uh, equity in motion events that we've had. Perfect. I would recommend that people go on and, and see those because those were those are really great um, panel discussions that you organized. Thank you very much. My time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thanks. Um, since we're at Council, I'll just move the recommendation first before I ask my questions, if that's okay, Chair Salvador. I'll second. So the, the Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton Committee's request to establish one subcommittee for the 2024 work plan as included in attachment three of the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02280 be approved. Now I'll second. Uh, so moved by Councillor Rutherford, seconded by Councillor Wright. Uh, so we have a recommendation on the floor. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, um, would Question. you like to continue with questions? Yes, have, please. If, go if ahead. If, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I... I have a few questions. I guess I'm going to start with one that, uh, you know, lots of work has happened. What are you most proud of uh, looking back retroactively at 2023? Oh my, that's not one of the questions I prepped for, but a fantastic question. And I appreciate that it comes from you because I have so much familiarity with you. Um, so on a personal level, I really enjoyed Equity in Motion. Um, it was a uh, a project that started from nothing within one of our subcommittees and grew to this four-part series that really um, showcased a lot of our members' strengths in, in collaborating with the community and showcasing amazing women and gender diverse people in the community. It allowed a platform for others to share and people to learn. So that was a, a huge importance um, that we placed on um, the project subcommittee and something that they really ran with. Um, but it was also something that the whole committee rallied towards every event. We had large numbers of WAVE um, members coming to the events. Um, but another one that I really want to focus on as well is something that I'm really proud of is um, our Indigenous learning moments. Every meeting, we really ensure that we take time to A, do um, personalized land acknowledgements, but we wanted to take it one step forward. So in our meetings, we break out into small groups and we share something that we've done since our last meeting that either that shows reconciliation action in in process. So but it wasn't meant to be a showing of what you've done or what you haven't done. It's meant to just share with the people around you so that they can learn, they can see what other um, steps they can take because everyone's different on their learning journey. So that was uh, something that I've heard great feedback on from our committee and we'll definitely keep moving forward with that. So those two things I'm really proud of our committee for. Thank you. And now I'm going to, I appreciate that answer. Now I'm going to ask a little bit of harder questions. <laughs> And Works for me. We actually go to administration. You know, sure. one of the things that I've been really grappling and struggling with, just looking at the totality of the, the reports, is the disparity or the differences in staff hours amongst the various advisory committees. And this committee, amongst any other, always talks about equity. Um, 170 hours is the highest of any of the advisory committees. Um, even higher than accessibility, which I think was at 130. And, you know, 
Yeah, and then whereas like ETS advisory boards at I think you know forty, or same with the, <laughs> the energy transition advisory, is at forty. So I guess just you know with the reduction in committees because I recognize that there used to be a lot more subcommittees with Wave and as. Ariza mentioned they really narrowed it down to one request for subcommittee. Why are the average the hours not changing with such a reduction in subcommittees to administration? Hi there, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, my name is Matthew Chung. I'm an acting manager over in the social identity and social inclusion section. I think something like uh, an estimated amount of hours is certainly going to be part of a continuous improvement process. I think we've seen really good momentum in 2023 with WAVE. And I think as we figure out what the new structure will look like with only one subcommittee, I think it's better to go in with our eyes open and know what we're working with rather than reduce and adjust afterwards. Uh, this is something that I'm really happy to work with Ariza on and obviously in consultation with yourself and Councillor Wright um, and of course the city, uh, the office of the city clerk there too. Uh, but in short, I, I think WAVE has done really great work. We want to continue to see that progress and we will have to be really strategic in alignment with the goals for this uh, this year essentially and recognizing the resources that we have uh, both within the team and across the corporation okay I'm, i might have to come back thank you thanks councillor rutherford councillor stevenson yeah thank you so much really appreciate the work that's happened in the work plan that's proposed i particularly like the burnout framework i think that's an excellent uh excellent initiative that's that's going to be underway just wanted to connect in terms of you know, I, I really appreciate the intersectional lens that, that WAVE has taken. And just wondering, given given um, recent events and, and, you know, areas of key priorities, what sort of, and, and, I, and the question is also just how we manage with some of our adv other advisory committees, but just thinking about uh, youth right now and some of the supports that they may need, uh, particularly gender diverse youth. Just wondering if you're making those connections with the youth council or, or other youth organizations to to support that and, and help amplify their voices. Definitely, thank you for the question. So this has been an ongoing discussion within our committee. Um, something that we're really um, trying to focus on is including that gender diverse voice. Um, but our thoughts on that have are going to be extending over the next few months as our committee really manages how to best support a youth um, but gender diverse people. So um, our hope is that at the end of the day and as soon as possible, there is an advisory board for gender diverse individuals. This is a huge thing that WAVE can support in moving forward. Um, but in the meantime, as um, there isn't currently one. We know that, um, and women always do this, we take on that extra work and we're willing to do that so that in this transition period, there is someone looking out for those voices. So yeah, that can include reaching out to uh, the youth council. It always is something that our committee has as an additional lens to every decision that we make. It's something that um, members in our own committee look for when we're making decisions on, let's say, um, events that we want to plan or um, briefing notes that we're providing to council. So it is a lens that we're adding. However, from gender diverse and people in our committee, they have shared that it is a very multifaceted voice to add to our um, work. So ideally, if they could have um, their own advisory board to be able to really understand that contextual um, component to it, then that would be great. But in the meantime, we're we're working hard to yeah make those connections with let's say youth council, um, and we. Uh, have our policy subcommittee meetings that um, reach out to experts in the field to educate us so that we can then educate back um, to the community and to council. So that is our hope. Um, we are working on it, but um, it is it is an additional load for sure. 
Yeah, really appreciate those reflections. And I think I think we have a report coming back on that. Mm -hmm. soon, so um, appreciate that. Just in terms of uh, in the strategic plan, and I and I apologize if I've missed some nuance in the report too. I I really appreciate you know as a an advisory council an advisory group to council. Um, that really being a focus and in the broader community. Just wondering what the relationship is like in terms of um, having the opportunity to, like are you engaged by administration for, for different consultations? Um, just thinking as well about our GBA plus uh, analysis. What, like what's the relationship like with not just sort of the administration, folks in the administration that are directly supporting your work, but just sort of more broadly in, in the organization? In specifically the GBA plus organization? Uh, just in terms of, I, I think GBA plus being one um, aspect of the work that, that city administration does in terms of having the GBA plus analysis in each report. But for example, does, do city groups ever reach out to you to engage on, on specific policies coming forward in a proactive way? Or are you typically sort of seeing the reports and then providing responses at that point? Right. So how we've approached it thus far is that um, our counselor advisors will share, okay, in the coming months, this is what we're expecting to see. Um, this is how WAVE can um, address it in the future. So they give us a heads up of what's to come. So that allows us to not have to wait till that 10 day window of when the report is publicized. It allows our subcommittee to discuss, well, A, in our large committee too, but also our subcommittee to discuss, okay, how, how can WAVE um, proactively learn more about this so that when the report comes out, we can read it and provide that briefing note to all of you within a very short timeline. So we do reach out to experts just to educate us because even though we have a lot of lived experiences, some of these issues that are faced are so multifaceted. Um, so yeah, we reach out to experts that's sometimes within the city and sometimes outside of the city so that we can learn more. And then um, that informs the briefing notes that we provide back to council. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Councillor Paquette, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. And thank you for this uh, report. It's so fascinating and it's so heartening to hear all the great work. It's just, I love it and I'm very grateful. So I, I guess my, my question is, understanding that racialized women tend to be um, very much discriminated against and, and find a lot of challenges uh, in the community, but also within organizations and uh, in the corporate world. Um, and the fact that there are a lot of folks in power in, in, in these spheres who don't understand the importance or why bother with diversity and equity and inclusion, like their their opinion is, hey, merit rises to the top. Are we saying we're going to jump ahead of merit? You know, you know those attitudes. So, from the work that you're doing, I mean, I, I think that the city of Edmonton takes this very seriously, and I know other organizations want to take it seriously, but there there's a gap in their understanding of of why this is important and why it doesn't exclude anyone. And I'm wondering if you an opportunity to say anything to these folks what would it be <laughs> i i think the best way is to educate and something that wave has done to show that sharing of education is our equity in motion panels so something that we would share with them is come to these events learn about how women and gender diverse people can be impacted differently than people around and listen to what they're saying and how that experience may be different than your own. Um, it's about giving the space to uh, women and gender diverse people to share their experiences. And then ideally we're in a world where um, the people of power include women and gender diverse people instead of um, us looking up at them. Okay. so. And and to further that, because I think this is fascinating, and I'm I'm gonna I'm taking to heart everything you say, so that I can share it too. Um, when it comes to women and gender diverse uh, individuals, um, organizations might say, okay, so I get it. Like you, 
you want to be included. But how does that help us as an organization? Well, the people that this entity is serving is serving the whole community. And that whole community includes um, men, women, and gender diverse people. It's a full array of different experiences, different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, cultural experiences. So simply if the argument of um, profit, if you're, I feel like corporates, corporations hear that, and if they're going to want to see that on their their uh, number line then um you got to serve everyone in the community and and there's a lot of us that are not being um, served fully to the right extent so um purely on a profit sense it could be um beneficial for these communities but ideally beyond the profit sense uh they are doing it out of the uh goodwill of wanting everyone to feel included and um people uh, aiming to be um, part of a corporation or entity that values these um, these voices and these experiences and shares them with everyone. Excellent. So the woke agenda here, <laughs> put it that way, would be this is very sensible. It's practical. It's profitable. And if you're not on board, then uh, instead of thriving, you're probably going to see your organization diminish over time. So, You're missing out on some really good talent. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you very you much. everything you do. Thanks, Councillor Paquette. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I think um, everyone agrees this is how important piece of the work and to ensure the woman's voice uh, to be heard and to really reflect that our city's diversity and inclusion by you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the racialized women and for this piece, uh, as you probably know, and in our city, we have over 70 uh, racialized communities across the entire city. That means that multicultural uh, piece and in the city and is really significant. And based on my own experience and as a racialized counselor and to interact with racialized community, I heard over and over um, that uh, how to uh, make sure the racialized woman's voice to be included and in the decision making table and to be respected and to be to not to be discriminated and in certain way in terms of different background, different culture. So I just want, I look at your goals for the 2024. Can you tell me a little bit more? How would you, uh, what is the plan? What is the steps or strategies to really achieve that goal? Make sure uh, this uh, committee and uh, really can uh, support the value of the racialized woman and feel like their voice and to be heard. Thank you for that question. Something that pops to my mind right away is that we're in an active recruitment cycle and we've received fantastic um, applications. So we will be interviewing going forward and and including that um, I, I mean, it's impossible to have all 70 of those uh, communities involved in our 20 person group, but we will try our very best to have all of those um, voices represented. And it's something that we're actively doing in, in the coming days. We have interviews um, shortly aligned here. So that's one quick step that, um, that will have a ripple effect to um, multiple years down the road for WAVE members um, because recruitment impacts multiple years. So we're taking that seriously and, and we'll, um, we'll keep that in mind as we're going through a recruitment cycle. Um, yes, uh, that'd be great. And from that process, and another point is about, and no matter, and for the racialized women, they're in leadership role or in the just regular citizens, uh, I think, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the equity piece and be heavily supported and also lots of initiative related and in this way in waves committees goal and activities but just from an 
broader perspective, how could this be uh, well received or really have impact or influence on the broader level on the society to really make sure racialized women, no matter they're in leadership role or no matter they're in just general citizen role, they really feel like they're not discriminated. And so I would like to see some work on that piece. So is there anything related to that? Definitely. So, so A, as a racialized woman myself, I feel very supported on WAVE to take on this co-chair position. So that is something that the city of Edmonton is already doing. The committee is already um, taking those steps that someone like me is able to take on this leadership role and be in front of you all today. So something is already happening that is on the right train. Um, how we can keep that train moving forward is 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 kind of within some of our goals. So I'll I'll point out one of them that I think will will be beneficial to to your question. Um, um all right so one of our action items under our goals is to identify and support um groups that help promote gender diversity and um to city council and civic engagement. So our goal here is to ensure that all people, so it doesn't have to be people in leadership positions, but all people even just in the community um, have the resources to be able to appear before council. Do they know how? Do they have the access to, to do that? And something that WAVE is going to take on in our 2024 plan is to add that into our uh, website so that they can um, find those resources. Sorry, I see that the time is up. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Looking forward to those activities. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Rice, would you move the second round? Yeah, I can move second round. Second. Please vote on a second round. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you. I have a few more questions, just uh, kind of going back to the one that I got timed out on. So they're the same amounts and what I'm hearing is throughout the year of 2024, being that there's way less subcommittees for WAVE, uh, admin will, will look at that and then that would be reflected in the next annual report. Just want to summarize that I understood that. Back to you. Pardon me, I was looking for the uh, boot button there. Uh, yes, that is absolutely correct there, Councillor Rutherford. I think one key piece is figuring out, um, uh, as we kind of go throughout the year, really just trying to ensure that we have the proper resources in place and to monitor those hours in particular. I do agree with you. I do share those same concerns that it is um, quite a few hours, especially in comparison with our uh, with our other advisory committees, but I also recognize that this is really impactful work. I think there are further conversations required that I will have to have with uh, my branch manager in particular around staffing, should we anticipate um, increased workloads that we're unable to meet the demand for. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not concerned about increased workloads. I'm, I'm actually the opposite because, and quite frankly, I'm like, just to be candid, I'm a bit selfish here in that I know that there's a conversation forthcoming on an LGBTQ2S plus advisory committee. And I know one of the things that I anticipate hearing is the need for resources for that. And we've, I've also had conversations with WAVE and Ariza kind of alluded to it with her answers to Councillor Stevenson about how WAVE is, is in an active and live conversation about how while they've taken on the, some of the gender diverse stuff, they're actually not the best to speak for that entire community. Um, and that community has a lot of challenges right now. And so WAVE's position, in my understanding, and Ariza, correct me if I'm wrong, is to be advocating for that advisory committee in addition to WAVE, correct? Can I just first correct? <laughs> Definitely. So I'm, I'm just selfishly like, are there hours here? that when that comes back, so if that's what I'm coming to. So just, just full transparency that I'll probably note it and I'll probably bring it back at that discussion um, at that point. So so that, that was my question there. And then Aritza, I have one more question for you. This year, can you, you at the last um, 
meeting or report, annual report and 2023 plan, uh, a wave had asked for sort of an expanding of their mandate and two council advisors as opposed to one. And I just wanted to know, you know, kind of having worked with that through 2023, uh, how do you feel that that's played out? Is it what you envisioned? Uh, yeah, how is that going? How is that going? It's uh, that's a great question because it is going really well. Um, I know that Wave feels so supported by by both you and Councillor Wright, so we appreciate all of that. We are constantly updated of every month on what are some upcoming council uh, reports that are heading your way and how Wave can interact with that. And then um, I know that even outside of the wave meetings, um, having both counselors have been fantastic to showcase um, within our equity in motion panels. We've had both of you speak um, as keynotes on um, our events. So that's been fantastic. And we've always felt that uh, we're able to reach out to um, either counselor advisor when um, outside of meetings by email or by phone. So the support is is we feel it, we appreciate it, and, and we, we hope that it continues um, in the coming year. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions. Yes, thank you. Councillor Wright? Thank you. Th thank you. I, um, I think the two council um, councillors work as well, because if one of us can't make it, the other one can, and we stay connected. And, and so I think that works well. As, it helps um, with turnout. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to ask Matthew directly, <laughs> can we use some of those hours to reallocate to, to a LGBTQ plus committee? Uh, thanks so much uh, for your question there, Councillor Wright. Uh, I think it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Uh, one thing that I'm mindful of just managing my team is just wanting to ensure that each one of these advisory councils are given all the right resources. And I would be hesitant to immediately say yes in this moment, despite my excitement, uh, just recognizing all of the work that we ha have ahead of um, all supporting our diverse communities here. One consideration that has been raised as part of these discussions around WAVE is uh, trying to figure out the right balance between supporting women and also trying to figure out in what ways are we supporting gender diverse folks and thinking about the intersections uh, of these experiences when it comes to gender marginalization. And I just recognize that the issues that we're seeing before us, although we have been making a lot of progress within our society, they're still impacting us every single day. There's still so much catch up that we have to do. There's the problems that we're uh, trying to uh, address the here and now, and not to mention what other future problems are we going to come across? And again, how do we set ourselves up for success? So in closing, would, would I am genuinely interested in allocating hours to it, but I do think that it needs to be informed and we would have to strategize this approach. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to see... Um... Yeah, wave being impacted negatively by it, but I think if yeah, if things are going to change, that might that might free up something a, a little bit anyhow. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thanks, Councillor thank Wright. Um, okay, so not seeing any further questions on the board, we do have a recommendation on the floor. Uh, anyone to speak to this item? Not seeing anyone, so Councillor Rutherford to close. Joanne, did you want to speak? You go for it. Okay, I just want to, I won't take too long. Um, I think everybody on the Women's Advisory Voice of Edmonton, and I know even the name change from advocacy to advisory was challenging for for, for you, and I'm really excited for what's to come for, for the Women's Advoc Advisory Voice of Edmonton in 2024. It's been a joy to uh, work alongside, council, alongside Councillor Wright in bringing forward uh, the council perspective and advising in that way with such a passionate and diverse group of women that clearly love this city and clearly want to elevate one another and any other women and gender diverse folks within the city of Edmonton. And so it's it's such an honor to be able to to come to those meetings and I always leave energized as I know Councillor Wright does too because we talk about it afterwards. Um, 
it, it gives us hope uh, for, for the Edmonton of today and the future. And so thank you for, for all that you do. For anybody that's listening, uh, it, it's probably going to be one of the joys of, of my time on council is, is ending up on, on WAVE. And uh, thank you for, for everything. And I look forward to continuing the work with you in 2024. Thank you very much. I don't know if I can add, but it, it's <laughs> awesome to be able to um, uh, feel the support at, from council. And uh, thank you for us. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share WAVE's goals and uh, prospects upcoming um, with you all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ariza. Um, and, and well said, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, so let's vote on this. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Wonderful. So thank you, Ariza, for being with us this evening, for your presentation and for um, your service on WAVE. Uh, really appreciate your contribution to making our city a better place. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Take care. Bye. All right. So uh, next up is the Edmonton Combative Sports Commission. And I believe we have, uh, is Trevor on with us? Trevor or Andrew? Yes, I'm here. Oh, perfect, and I see Andrew as well. Uh, excellent, so thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, do you have a slide deck or just a verbal presentation? Uh, just a verbal presentation oh. this evening. Great, uh, so we'll hand over the floor to you and then uh, we'll see if there's any questions from council colleagues, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good evening, councillors. I'm Trevor Kelly. I'm the uh, chair of the Edmonton Combative Sports Commission. Uh, with me this evening is my vice chair, Andrew Soto. Uh, so I'll be presenting the report and work plan uh, for 2024 for the commission, and uh, both Andrew and myself will be available afterwards for any questions uh, that council may have. So I'll begin my presentation with giving a brief uh, rundown concerning uh, the commission's mandate. So there are three parties responsible for the regulation of combative sports in Edmonton. First, of course, being city council itself, which passes the bylaws which permit professional combative sports to even occur within the city, because uh, that's a requirement as the Criminal Code of Canada uh, makes uh, prize fighting illegal unless it is um, overseen by some kind of uh, uh, combative sporting authority. So for the city of Edmonton, that is the commission that fills that uh, role. Um, furthermore, um, the bylaws passed by city council uh, establish the duties for both the commission itself as well as its, its executive director. The executive director is a uh, city of Edmonton employee who's responsible for all operational matters concerning uh, the regulation of combative sports, including employing and training of officials, approval of applications for promoter licenses and event permits, and general operational oversight of sanctioning of events. The commission itself is a committee established by bylaw 15638, and it has been in place since uh, the year 1920 uh, and responsible since that time for the regulation of combative sports within the city. Uh, the commission is presently composed of seven volunteer members, uh, all of whom are staying on for at least one more year, so there will be no need to recruit any new members for 2024. Uh, the commission is not, does not take any operational role with respect to combative sports. Rather, the mandate of the commission is to strictly function as a regulator and to provide governance role by supplementing the bylaws of the city uh, with its own regulations and policies, which apply to promoters, athletes, officials, and the events themselves. The commission also serves as an appeal body with respect to decisions made by the executive director concerning applications for event permits and promoter license. So it effectively is an administrative tribunal on some occasion. That being said, appeals haven't been heard uh, very often. Uh, the last one was held in May of 2021. Uh, 2023, looking back, uh, was a, a better year uh, uh, with respect to the commission insofar as unlike uh, 2020 through 2022, there was no need to restrict the holding of combating sporting events for public health reasons related to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
During those years, the commission was repeatedly required to implement pauses on the acceptance of applications for event permits and promoter licenses in connection with the various waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thankfully, no further uh, resurgence has happened uh, in 2023 or 2024. Um, that being said, there was a pause uh, put in place uh, from August of 2022 through May of 2023 by city administration. The purpose of that pause was for city administration to do a fulsome review of the commission's uh, policies and regulations, as well as uh, just kind of examining uh, the role in which the city and the commission play with respect to the regulation of combative sports. Uh, since that pause was lifted in May, um, the commission has been open for the acceptance of um, event permits and promoter applications, uh, promoter license applications, I should say. Uh, that being said, <laughs> there haven't actually been any uh, events uh, held in Edmonton uh, since the end of that pause. Uh, the last combative sporting event held in Edmonton would have been in December of 2019, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, uh, the executive director uh, has fielded inquiries from several potential promoters considering holding events in Edmonton in the near future. Uh, as I said, uh, presently we uh, have a full complement. Uh, the commission recruited three new members in 2023 and continues to focus on its work. In 2018, the commission began uh, what was known as the Policy Review Project. Uh, the purpose of which has been to do a comprehensive review of all of the Commission's existing policies concerning the governance of combative sports. To date, the Commission has completed its review of four of its 13 policies and replaced them with updated, more streamlined regulations in their place. In November of 2023, the Commission held a retreat uh, for its members for the purpose of updating its work plan, this time with a specific view to coming up with a roadmap to complete the policy review project. The aim of the Commission going forward is to complete the policy review project by reviewing the remaining nine policies that have not been reviewed yet, uh, by reviewing three at a time for about four to six months uh, per block of three, with a view to completing the project by either the end of the first or second quarter of 2025. Financially, the Commission is in very good standing. Uh, the Commission does not receive any revenue from the city's uh, tax. Rather, the Commission is self-funded through the holding of combative sports with revenue generated from permit and license applications, but also through a portion of ticket sales. Although there have not been any combative sports held in Edmonton since December of 2019, there was a UFC event held in July of 2019 and prior to that one in July of 2017, both of which provided a substantial amount of funds to the Commission. Presently, the Commission still has funds left over, so to speak, from those events in excess of $200,000. Um, those funds are significant and should be able to fund the Commission for many, many years going forward, even in the absence of any uh, solid plans to hold any combative sports in the near future. Uh, generally speaking, the Commission's prospective budget for 2024 anticipates expenditures that might include training of officials in the event that um, any combative sports are held this year, as well as possible training for Commission members. Um, as I mentioned before, the Commission does act as an appeal body, so in years past we have uh, uh, put Commission members uh, under or had commission members undergo administrative tribunal training, uh, as well as there's a hope to send a delegation again this year of some commission members to the annual conference for the Association of Boxing Commissions, of which the commission is a member, and for which this year uh, the annual conference is scheduled for mid July to be held in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so, subject to any questions, uh, that is my report. Uh, as I said, Andrew and I are available to ask answer any questions uh, that the um, council may have. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Trevor. Um, do we have uh, any questions, uh, Councillor Stevenson? Thank you very much for the report. I was wondering if you are connected at all with the work that Explore Edmonton is doing in terms of event attractions, um, just 
you know, as, as the year progresses and we're maybe looking at hosting other events, if that's a, a connection that's been created? Uh, no, it is not. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Um, that is something that I, I'd be interested in looking in. That being said, um, what, one of the, you know, parts of the commission's mandate is we, we're essentially supposed to take a neutral approach with respect to the sport, uh, meaning it's sort of outside of our purview to necessarily promote um, the sport in any meaningful way. Um, so, I mean, initiatives such as that um, would be good with respect to trying to attract potential promoters uh, to the city, such as, you know, in, in the future, if the USC chooses to hold an event again. Um, that being said, um, as I said, the commission, uh, our, our mandate is more or less uh, limited to taking a neutral stance, um, not promoting the sport, so to speak, so much as just uh, providing governance over it. That's a, that's a really important distinction. I appreciate you, you educating me on that. Uh, and it it makes me feel that that's uh, you know an even greater opportunity there then to um, you know ensure that Explore Edmonton is is aware of you so that if they are hearing of events that are interested in, in coming that they understand that process and and how to connect them uh, to yourselves to go through that regulatory process so something to follow up with um, I think within our administration potentially but making some of those introductions I think could be uh, really complementary in the, in the work that's underway. Uh, but thank you so much for the overview. Thanks for the ongoing work uh, that you're doing. I, it's much appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else on the board for questions. Oh, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm just, you know, looking at, at, you know, in comparison to the other reports and that that we've received from some of the other committees. Um, do, do you... Like, do you meet on a monthly basis? Are, are those live streamed as well? Do you not need that sort of administrative support from, from we, the city? We, we, yes, we, we do meet um, the, the second Monday of every month. Um, those, those meetings are live streamed and open to the public. Um, I mean, it's not often that the public does um, attend. Uh, that being said, every once in a while, there will be a meeting that is widely attended, such as... Um, the meeting that followed um, the pause that was put in place in 2018, uh, following the death of a uh, boxer um, that that happened, um, I believe several dozen <laughs> people attended that meeting um, from the combative sports community to um, you know make their voices heard with respect to that pause that was put in place. Okay, so the the support that you're getting from our administration then is sufficient then for you to manage. Yeah, yes, okay. it, 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 it is sufficient. Okay, okay. I was just looking at looking at the hours and, and things like that. Um, yeah, and I, I was going to ask if there has been any other events um, since the pandemic, but you've indicated nothing since 2019. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had. I just wanted to check on the on the resources that you had available. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Ray, would you by any chance like to move the recommendation to receive your information? Sure, I can do that. So that the March 5th, 2024 Office of the City Clerk Report, OCC 02282 be received for information. And I'll second that. Great. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor to receive for information. Um, any, any further questions or uh, anyone to speak to this item? Very briefly, Councillor Knack, could you just take the chair? I've got the chair. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, just wanted to thank the two two speakers for coming out and uh, joining us this evening. Um, just wanted to express my thanks for uh, the important governance and oversight role that you play uh, when it comes to combative, combative sports and events in our city. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe I'll have to pop into one of those meetings so I can learn a little bit more. Um, but thank you, I really appreciate your time today. Councillor Wright, would you like to, or I'll, I'll take the chair back, Councillor Knack. I'll return the chair. Thanks so much. Uh, Councillor Wright, anything to close? No, I think you've said it all. Thanks very much. Great. Uh, let's vote.
We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Um, wonderful. Uh, Trevor and Andrew, thank you. Um, really appreciate you being here. And we'll, we'll move on to our next item. So you can, um, you can head off for the night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Uh, so the last, the last item of the day is the Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board. Uh, and it looks like we have a number of folks joining. So we have uh, Giselle, uh, Serena, Emily, and uh, Mudasser. Uh, are, are you all four here tonight? Yes, it looks like it. Perfect. Yes, we are. Wonderful. Um, great. So do you have a slide deck for a presentation or just a verbal tonight? We're doing a verbal presentation tonight. Thank you. Okay, great. So we'll hand the floor over to you and then we'll follow up with some questions. Thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, good evening, everyone. And I'm happy to do the presentation on behalf of the Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board for our annual report and work plan. Um, I am the current and outgoing chair of the board, and this is my last year. And um, Serena Tang, our current vice chair, is here, as well as our incoming chair, Emily Bani, and incoming vice chair, Madasar Saraj. First, I would like to begin by acknowledging everyone who's been integral to ensuring that this group of volunteers are able to fulfill their mission in providing input to Council on how to make our public transit better. So that includes the Edmonton Transit staff, the liaison, admin support, directors and operations staff that provide information that we need, our city councillor liaison, Councillor Rutherford, and as well as the Office of the City Clerk and the members of other ABCs. Finally, I want to take a moment to just recognize the efforts of all the board members who contributed to our outcomes for the 2023 year. So the year uh, started on an exciting note because of the City Council's four-year budget deliberations. And the first thing we did is we wrapped up our um, feedback on that one. We uh, And then also we had our presentation on our report on youth and perception of safety. And also early, that, early last year, we began collecting firsthand experiences of navigating transit in winter to and from bus stops. The new term for board members, which is in May, it made things even more exciting for the board with the start of three new board members, making our team a complete roster of 12. The board met every single month, as we always do, where we provided input in transit matters in various ways. First, by providing feedback during presentations by administration during our actual meetings. Second, by identifying transit topics being discussed at committee meetings and providing what we try to call as the rapid response feedback. And third, our long term term working group slash subcommittees, which involves research and report development by a small subgroup of board members completed over several months. Our report outlines in detail the schedules and the topics of these presentations that we had and that we presented specifically in March, October, and December. We took serious consideration the feedback from last year, and we worked hard to collaborate with other ABCs in our reports. This year also offered unique opportunities to have deeper discourse about transit, including attending and participating in the Canadian Urban Transit Association Conference hosted by the city, as well as the Transit Camp event earlier in the year. At SAB's retreat takes place in September of every year to give new board members a couple months to be familiar with processes, but at the same time, for them not to wait too long until they have a chance to give input of, on what the research topics would be for the upcoming 12 year cycle. So since the fall of 2023, two working groups are in progress, which is the one on fair evasion and perception of safety in LRT. And with council's approval and support, one will be launched in the spring. At SAB, we'll go through many changes this upcoming year with five new board members joining, a new chair and vice chair, and all the governance related changes that had and will be implemented. This year in 2023, uh, we were fully virtual, but in early 2024, we switched into a hybrid model for our meetings. And we've also observed uh, changes in the staffing support for our board, so we have to go through the motions. But given what I have seen in my time at ETSAB, I'm just so happy and proud that we have a resident base 
advisory board in Edmonton, something that municipality, many municipalities don't have, and we need to remind ourselves of that. I'm happy and proud of the team in 2023, and I'm positive that ETSA will continue to do great things in the future. And as city council and administration discuss options for the board for the upcoming year, um, here are my final remarks. At SAB and its volunteers deserve the appropriate amount of support so they can bring their best work in sharing their time, knowledge, and experience in recommending improvements in transit that could range from staffing, funding, and flexibility in permissions and processes. As a board, we have the potential to achieve even more with enhanced support that will allow our members to feel confident and assisted in the work they do. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you so much, Giselle, for the um, the overview and um, introduction. So I'll go to Councillor Rutherford to start with questions. Okay. Um, I'll start with questions, and then I do have a motion similar to Councillor Salvador's motion on the energy transition. Um, just digging into that a bit more, you know, I, I am starting to see the juxtaposition. Like, we just talked to WAVE. They have 170 staff hours, right, in their report. Um, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, as the council representative, I am hearing from EDSAB challenges. And again, not to, this isn't a criticism of administration. It's what the structure you're set up with, the supports that you're given. What does EDSAB need to be successful into 2024? Um. So there, there are a few ways that I can um, look at this. I think in a very casual way during the lunch and that we had last November, my um, oversimplified answer was, if the level of staff support is returned to 2018 levels, that would be great. But I understand circumstances were different then, that the admin support there was, had been helping the board for many, many years and was very proactive with, uh, anticipating needs and establishing um, items in our Google Drive, things like that. Um, so that that is def and in the past year, there's been some turnover. So uh, regular items that are important, but are not necessarily done every month, they get missed. And then the catching up is really difficult. So additional support to stabilize and maintain that I think would be great. Um, I also had the chance to read ahead of time the administration recommendation for our um, subcommittee and we were told that it, it says in there that there is no admin support available for even just one subcommittee so that I think that would be important um, additional support for the board to have one or two um, subcommittees to be able to continue doing their work is it, it's uh, that is also very important so yeah long story short um, staffing uh, I think is a really important um, component Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess to administration. Is somebody from administration on board? Yes. Line? Yep, I'm here, Councillor Rutherford. It's Carrie and Sarah's on the line as well. When I read like that amount of hours and I'm thinking about, like we literally just had somebody that said that they spend, that their staff time is 80 hours per meeting, which I think is a bit, a lot, but that's what was said in this meeting today. And I see 24 to 30 hours. I'm thinking that's probably just staff time for prep meeting, posting of the regular meeting. There's no real staff time for any additional meetings with the chair. Like what, what does that look like in practice? Yeah, so I think we're definitely under reporting. Um, so we do have a lot of staff time put into monthly report updates from administration to the board to help them understand uh, kind of what's happening. We also have a uh, time where I have meetings um, with Giselle. We decided that it would be as needed. Um, with the pr uh, previous chair, it was more regular. Um, I'm totally flexible to meet as needed. Um, in terms of, you know, our ability to staff, um, we don't have dedicated positions to this. Mm -hmm. So we are pulling yeah. people in to support it. And if it's a council priority, uh, you know, to want to have the subcommittee, there'd be trade-offs on our side. I'd have to pull people off of other work. Yeah, and, I, and I'm like, before we even get into debating the subcommittees, 
Like I just think about even their point, their goal one, right? And maybe I'll go to Giselle. You know, goal one is about providing timely responses to like transit related things. Like I'm thinking about the public spaces bylaw that you know consolidates the transit passenger bylaw that we know will come back in the fall of 2024. Um, so that's your goal one, correct? Um, yes, that is correct. And um, including, um, and you, you've seen in our meeting, so we had a few uh, items that will be discussed in committee this month. So that would be part of that too, is providing that opportunity for, um, for the team to provide a, a quick feedback, feedback on once the agenda items are available for viewing. So I'm just wondering if just even to do that, let alone the ARC subcommittee, if that staff time, like I guess is, is that staff time accurately being reported to what is currently happening and what is needed? I guess is the question I'm trying to get at and maybe that's to carry. Yeah, I, I think that would be to to even, carry. Even outside of the subcommittee, like before we even get into a subcommittee conversation. Yeah, I think she's all described some of the challenge. We've had turnover in that administrative position, uh, which is always tough. So we're working through that. Um, and I think I feel comfortable with the two roles we have assigned. We are trying to support the regular monthly meetings. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of staff working on those reports too. Um, to try and be supportive. So there's room for improvement, but I think I can definitely support those monthly meetings. Okay, I'll come back around. Thanks, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Knack, could you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate the answers to, to Councillor Rutherford's question. Um, I guess I wanted to follow up when I look at the goals and goal two in particular, I just had a question about how some of the topics are selected um, by the board. So goal two mm -hmm. is around, um, yeah, completing several reports conducted by subcommittees uh, in order to provide in-depth insights on transit topics identified by the board. Um, can you just help me understand how those topics are selected? Absolutely. So um, ATSAP conducts an annual retreat once a year. Um, in the past, during your first years at ATSAP, this takes place in February. So imagine a new board member joining in May and waiting for like up to 10 months before they can give input on what these uh, subcommittee topics would be. That's why we changed it a year and a half ago to September so that board members, new ones especially, only have to wait for like four months before they get the chance to recommend this topic. And um, with the support of um, the, the administration um, staff that we have, we conduct a full day retreat. We talk about um, processes, get a presentation from ETS, and then brainstorm and, and vote for the topics that resonate most with the board members. And we schedule them for the next um, 12 months, so it's like a 12-month 12, 12 cycle from the retreat, so from September, not from January. So that's how they get selected. Okay, okay, that's really helpful. I um, mm -hmm. appreciate the context. Uh, I guess I'm also wondering, you know, when you're having those conversations, um, when you're at the retreat, how, how are council priorities related to transit uh, sort of reflected in those conversations, if you will? Because um, I'm just trying to think about you know, how do we how do we maximize the time and energy that um, that folks on ETSAB are are putting in and the the reports that you're producing, you know, when they do make their way up to council, um, we want to make sure they're actionable and, and uh, topical. So, yeah, how how is that factored in when some of those topics are selected? Uh, I mean, as part of the retreat, there is an opportunity for ETS and our counselor to do a presentation. So um, there is a day of context that really helps board members. And I imagine that in between, in the board meetings that they participate between May until September, it gives them an opportunity to like observe and identify what topics um, they would consider suggesting at the retreat. And with the help of the facilitator, we that's how we um, hash it out, so to speak. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that makes sense to me. And um, some of the reasons I'm asking this, I, I see that the topic for the subcommittee, uh, the proposed subcommittee is the ARC implementation review. Uh, so yeah, wondering maybe just some, some perspectives on that and, and why that one was selected and uh, where, where the committee would intend to go with that. 
The terms of reference, reference will definitely be decided by the future board members once this is, uh, the, once the opportunity to officially pursue this is actually available. But from what I recall last September 2023, when one of these topics, when this topic was suggested, I think it reminded the board members of the other working group that we did earlier in the year, which is the um, mobility and accessibility in bus stops. So this is the intention at the time, if I recall correctly, it's not to review all the um, uh, reports from the administration or whatever, because it is still going through the pilot stages. But, but instead, just like monitoring your personal experiences and filling out the forms on how it feels like to go from one bus stop to the other, it's pe the people's personal experiences with using ARC because there had been some, um, let's just say, many points of improvement from the user experience that are identified and there's interest in, in compiling that and presenting to council. So very um, uh, pr primary research, first-hand experience oriented. Again, this is what was based on the conversation last September, but things might change if once they officially talk about how they wanted to uh, do a report on this. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I might come back for another, but I'll hold off for now and go to Councillor Stevenson and Richard, take the chair back. No, the chair. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the work and the presentation tonight. I think, you know, your, your last comment just sort of around some of that primary research, for me, sort of highlighted one of the tensions I see with the advisory committee. Um, and it's sort of that distinction between being sort of representative engagement or direct engagement. Um, and I, and I think that you know, I think of our advisory bodies as being, um, you know, that representative engagement that you're a cross section of different diverse perspectives and, and we can kind of go to you for an opinion. Whereas I see at, at SAB often sort of turning around and then, and then going out and doing more of that direct engagement. And just wondering if that is sort of how you see your role and then just recognizing Again, wanting to set our advisory committees up for for success, and just you know, recognizing some of the challenges of trying to have that 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 reach and that that ability to connect to a lot of folks for that primary research. Hmm. I, I have. I need a moment to think this through. It's it's really interesting, Councillor, because my I in, in the past few months I've been really in this weird position of I don't want to you know impose all my thoughts and opinions about the board because I'm leaving. I'll be done in two months. <laughs> so so there's kind of that angle that I'm kind of percolating in my head. But I think um, as far as whether um, the board members think that they are, uh, for lack of a better word, like representative of all the um, Edmontonians who take transit, th there is even a bit of uncertainty there because we all know that we don't represent all experiences of Edmontonians from all walks of life and we have to make a conscious effort to to incorporate that in our feedback but um, at, at the same time they know they or we know our, our limitations as far as um, resources you know it's not like we have money to um, get access to academic journals or um, as you may recall Councillor Stevenson last year uh, we were not given the opportunity to we, we can get um, copies of reports from the inside community, but we are not allowed to suggest questionnaires or anything like that through the inside community. So there is this uh, um, uh, uncertainty, I suppose. And that's why people try to be creative as to how to collect feedback and give meaningful um, information to council. And well, as you may recall, the last report we had on ridership improvement strategies, that is the, what we did for that one is really exclusively just reading reports from admin, which yeah. is different from uh, accessibility of uh, bus stops in winter. So yeah. I suppose yeah. there is, sorry, yeah, there, there's a variety. Sorry, I just have a couple minutes yeah. left and want to go through that. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I think, um, you know, I think, I think we want 
to set the advisory committee up for success. And I think that as you highlight, there are just resource constraints that, well, and, and maybe I wanna, maybe if I could go to um, Ms. Haunton McDonald as well, because I think, I think it's very much sort of a both and. I think that, you know, having a representative group um, to connect with with EdSAB is, is a really important piece. That broader rider uh, survey and engagement, like just to confirm my understanding, that is work that you and your team do, that you have resources to conduct sort of on a, a grander scale? Yeah, we have a rider research program that's quite comprehensive, probably one of the bigger ones in the country, um, has lots of different tactics, different groups that are engaged. And I just wanna say like, I really appreciate Giselle's perspective. We value their input. We are gonna be more intentional about reaching out to all the advisory boards. So as we're contemplating work, not just bringing reports once they're ready to go, uh, but I just wanna like confirm our commitment is there to engage with all of them, youth council, WAVE, et cetera. Uh, we appreciate the time that the volunteers give. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe just briefly, I was just wondering if administration does have uh, an evaluation plan in place for the ARC, ARC uh, card rollout, if that's work that you're intending to do already? For sure, like ARC is still being implemented. It's regional. There's some sensitivities around uh, the upcoming groups and some really uh, kind of critical timelines we're working with with the region and some contractual stuff with VIX as well. Um, but for sure, that's part of the plan. We have open payment uh, that'll be introduced in 2025, knock on wood. And following that, we'd be ready uh, to start doing some of that evaluative work. And I know the city auditor's office had mentioned to me before, they also have an interest in doing an audit. So I'll just flag that for you as well. Great, appreciate it. I'm out of time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, my question is more for um, maybe um, Ms. Everett, just in regards to the, um, the the format of the reporting that was provided to the committees. When I, when I look at FTE, to me, that's full-time equivalent, correct? Uh, yes, that was the intention. Okay, so if, if I have somebody and I'm looking at CSAB's report um, where it says 0.75, so that means 75% of that person's time is spent, but that only works out to be average hours of, of 30 hours a month. I, I'm just wondering, are, are these are these are these true estimates of of the hours or the FTE? I think that they're as accurate as or, well, the committees and admin could be at the time. I'm sure that it changes, but I think that that's their estimation of the amount of time. And uh, we provided the templates, and so the way in which they completed them it was up to the committee's discretion. Councillor, if I might clarify further, if okay. that would help for this one, we were shared that for FTEs, we would report the number of positions we have supporting it, but that's not in this case two full-time positions. We have two positions that do this as a very small portion mm -hmm. of their overall job, and that's what's equal to the hours. So we do not have two full-time equivalents oh. them on the board. Okay, okay, so that's, mm -hmm. okay, thank you for the clarity because that just didn't seem to um, correlate across all the reports. Um, actually, I don't think any of them are our actual full-time equivalents. So it's just number of staff doing something off the side of their desk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Okay, but the hours are probably the more accurate thing that we need to be looking at. Okay. Right. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I just wanted clarity on that. Would you like to move a second round, Councillor Wright? Sure, move a second round. Second. Please vote on a second round. I'm um, yes. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Okay, um, for the 2024 work plan, you, you've requested a subcommittee for the ARC project. When would you anticipate that would start? 
Because um, you have the, two ongoing that are kind of still legacy from 2023, correct? That is correct. If uh, in the ideal situation, if all goes well, both of those um, reports will be completed in April, just in time for us departing board members to attend our last board meeting so that uh, when the uh, with a new team, new board, new leadership team, new board members start in May. They can decide whether they can start it right away or wait a couple months. There's a bit of flexibility, but it will be after spring, after May 2024. Okay, because what I'm contemplating is a motion which is going to ask administration, similar to what we did with the energy transition, to provide a report on, um, I'm just trying to pull it up here. Uh, provide a report on options for resourcing. Um, and they said that that would take about three, that's about a three month. So if we make that motion today, we're looking at about a three month window before that report comes back. And then we mm -hmm. can actually see what are some of the trade-offs, uh, what are, you know, what priorities would be, uh, be not moving forward for the subcommittee, those kind of things. Uh, what are your th thoughts on like the timing and sequencing of that. So if you weren't told today that you could have a subcommittee, but there was there was a commitment to work, because I heard from you that it's sort of not urgent in the next three months to strike up that subcommittee. Um, yeah, this actually reminds me of what happened last year where um, when we were thinking of starting two of the uh, subcommittees in the spring, we were told to um, wait to see if those um, those meetings can, there's resources for those meetings to be publicly broadcasted. And we were told no. So we just have to mm. keep doing things the way we have. And that's what we did for the ridership improvement strategies and the, and the groups that we worked on in fall 2023. So um, I think as far, so what would likely happen is if it takes, let's say until uh, it, that we may, so like July or August until this will be discussed, um, then there will not be any working groups or subcommittees in the summer and they would, and the team will likely discuss their new batch of um, research topics in the upcoming retreat of September, 2024 is what is likely going to happen. And I will um, yeah, have a discussion with the incoming team to see what other activities they can do for in the meantime to ensure there is good onboarding and you know expectations yeah, you know clear expectations a, that there's are a high turnover of EDSAB right so you're mm. going to also see a lot of new folks uh, yes five people coming in yeah so that's you're going to need time for getting okay okay and then why was it staggered can you can you provide me with the historical reference as to why you do your retreats and your pl your work planning in September because it's making these kind of things a little bit awkward. Yes. Yeah, I'll be happy to explain. Uh, I guess I'm the oldest, long, longest term board member. Um, when I joined in 2018, um, so the board term starts in May and the retreat happens the following year in February. And I've received feedback, very, very clear feedback from many board members, including ones that departed in 2021, that that's too long. They feel like they're really not very engaged and not as, the onboarding didn't feel as smooth and integrated because they're just observing for seven, eight, nine months until the retreat happens when everything makes a little bit more sense and they feel um, invited to actually give more um, feedback and be more active. That's why it was pushed a little bit, um, a little bit sooner, right? So that a new board member will only have four months to wait and observe and whatnot before the retreat happens, and they can share their input. Um, I remember when exploring these options, there's no hard and fast rule as to when the retreat is going to be. So the future team um, admin. Office of the City Clerk and and EDSAB can look into other options as to when the when is the best time for them to have the retreat that is not too early or not too late. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to need another round. I apologize. I'll move another round. Second. Second. Please vote on another round.
We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I think I'm just going to, in, in the light of what I've heard, and, and I'm going to move the motion that I alluded to. So I'm going to move that administration provide a report outlining options for resourcing support for Edmonton Transit Service Advisory Board Subcommittee for the 2024 work plan um, and return to committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the floor from Councillor Rutherford. Would you like to introduce? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I know when we talked about e, uh, the energy transition, we did also, you know, say strike up a subcommittee, um, but that was really uh, some pretty urgent stuff that was coming up with all of the transition and change in ETS Advisory Board, plus a few other things that I think uh, need to be unpacked just in terms of this off the side of your desk kind of work and um, even making sure that the time and effort of ETS Advisory Board is being utilized in, in the best way possible to have the biggest outcome. Like if we're hearing that ARC is potentially already got some work and it involves regional players, maybe we need to relook at that. So I think there's just a lot of context and conversation that needs to happen around, around this. Um, and I think it does need to come to committee um, for that more fulsome discussion because this has been a problem that I've identified for about a year now. And uh, as great as administration is, it's not their fault, but they're, they're just, they're doing it off the side of their desk. Um, and, and I think it needs to be a bigger conversation. It's, it's, it's one of the things we as council talk about being a, a huge priority and we've, we've demonstrated that so much. So as a council in the investments we've made in transit, um, we need to provide that support to our uh, community uh, members that are taking the time out of their lives to give us real world transit user experience uh, in a way that, that they feel their time is valued and we, can take their input and really utilize it in a, in a meaningful way. So I feel like this, this allows me to work behind the scenes a little bit more with administration, have this report come and sort of suss out some of that. Uh, I think putting a subcommittee on at this point is a little bit too premature because I think there's just some other factors that we have to work out. So that's why I chose to do this instead of the recommendation in the report. Happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Paquette for questions? No, just to speak. Just to speak. Uh, Councillor Knack, could you take the chair, please? I've got the chair. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much for this motion. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, just a few questions. Um, yeah, I guess to, to administration, um, would this give you time for some further conversations and refinements around around potential topic areas uh, for ETSAB to work on? So I think, um, so we did present at the, at the board uh, retreat. We have our annual service plan that's imminently gonna be published. Um, I think there's lots of opportunity for alignment um, and we're happy to support, like I'm happy to, to meet with them again if they wanna talk about it. Uh, and explore other topics. Okay, okay, that's great to hear. Because yeah, it was a bit of a flag, just to hear that um, that work is is sort of already already planned and underway around the ARC um, uh, implementation review. So that's good. Um, also curious. You know what? Maybe the answer is. I don't know if I have another question. I'll ask it anyways. But when I'm thinking about some of the trade offs. Uh, if this motion were to not move forward and and we were to move forward with subcommittee right away, I assume there would be, we'd be compromising other areas of work. Is that right? If we were to vote yeah. staff to this? So again, I don't like, we don't have staff dedicated just to this. So I'd be pulling people in uh, based on providing admin support for the MGA requirements for subcommittee meetings to be public. So that admin support piece would be a new request for admin. Um, and then depending on the time of day, there could be OT, et cetera. Then there's the kind of analyst coordination 
uh, support. So I'd have to pull the person that we have uh, as an analyst. She does our detailed ridership analysis. I'd probably have to scale that back to allow time for her to do this. Uh, and then subject matter experts, depending on whatever the topic is. So for ARC, uh, the person leading our ARC implementation, uh, we'd have to approach him about supporting the work as an SME. So that would be the trade-off, is it's potentially going to disrupt kind of the work that's being done uh, in that area. Okay, okay, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, no, no further questions for me and I'll take the chair back, Councillor Knack. I'll return the chair. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Just wanting, uh, I, I think this is a great motion, really appreciate the, um, the comprehensive approach of this. Uh, could administration just remind me, I know it's, it's a bit late, but we are undertaking sort of a more comprehensive advisory committee review. What's the status or when's our next touch point on, on that project? Um, there are a number of different actions and they all have different timelines. So we would have to know kind of what particular of you want. Well, I guess my, my question is maybe just if there's an opportunity, because I think, I think what's come out for me, um, and I'm just maybe maybe to the mover. So so I note that you are sort of specifying Edmonton the S STAB, but just wondering if there's a more global look that you want to take in terms of how uh, advisory committees are supported. Is that? Yeah. So in conversation, I do have a subsequent after this. Ah, okay. Um, because what you're alluding to is yes, there is a body of work, but when I talk to uh, the clerk's office that's related specifically to clerk city clerk support ah. and so we are having a gap in our governance review around the the work that the Other. the the areas that the advisory committee is embedded in are are how they're set up for success to properly support so I do have a subsequent uh, planned for today after we, but this one is specific to ETS advisory board because I still think in the short term we need this to come back so that they are not that they are able to do a subcommittee if they if we have the resources and if they have a topic that we really see as valuable and that work uh, from what I've understood in my back and forth with administration will take uh, a bit longer so that would be looking into next year. I gotcha. Okay. And so I'm just wondering about the possible outcomes when this report comes back. So let's say we hear, I mean, I think we've started to hear a bit tonight that that there are resource implications, that, that some strategic work would, would have to be scaled down or diverted. Um, so I guess at this, this moment, not knowing what a, an alternative topic could be, I guess what I'd be reluctant is sort of you know, taking the time to get the report and then ultimately deciding that, that we don't want to move forward with the subcommittee at this point, recognizing that generating the report generates work as well. Um, so I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think as the council appointed representative, and again, this is, this is the structure, not the individuals in administration. I've been seeing this for a year and, and raising flags and concerns. And I, I do think, you know, we, are, we have a high turnover in ETS advisory board because they're not feeling valued, quite frankly. And, and I think it is an important conversation that needs to happen. Whatever, whether a subcommittee comes out of that discussion or that report or not, uh, I do think this, this is something that my colleagues need to be aware of. We need to have a, we need to, 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 to look at it. Okay, so it sounds like there's more that you would anticipate coming back with this report than, than solely resourcing? No, just the resourcing on the, the subcommittee, but I think it's gonna shore up how off the side of the desk this mm. advisory committee is being done. <laughs> okay, so then, Okay, and then you have a subsequent motion that will maybe look at the solution to the gaps that this report may identify. Yeah, I can't speak to a motion that's not on the floor, but I, I do have something that would look more holistically at our advisory committees and 
and how we're resourcing them equitably. Okay, so then maybe just in my last few seconds to administration, maybe to Ms. Hunt McDonald, what, what would be the resource implication of the of the motion that you have here? Is it would it be a fairly straightforward report for you to prepare? Yeah, I mean I think so. Um and if the desire is to do this quickly, like we could explore doing it as a memo. Um, and I just want to be clear, like we will make this work. <laughs> I don't want to be obstructionist or be no, perceived no, no. as being no. difficult. We will make this work. We are very grateful for the work they do. <laughs> no. um, yeah. So c completing the report for this motion, uh, I, I hope it's straightforward. We have evidence and information we can pull. And if your preference is to do it faster, we could do it as a memo. I'll just offer that as an option. Great, thank you, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Um, Councillor Paquette, are you on for questions? Remind me, no. Are you to speak? I'm uh, not, just to speak. Just to speak. And then Councillor Wright, you just remove yourself. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I think we have one more question here, so we'll need one more round. So moved. So. Second. Please vote on another round. We have all the votes. Display the vote. That's carried. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, just to question, I know that you mentioned Ms. Houghton McDonald about a memo uh, in place of a report, but this report that's come forward today says a decision is required. So if we get a, if we're saying we need more information to make that decision, and it comes in the form of a memo we have a challenge too. So I, maybe it's not to you, maybe it's to the clerk. Yes, if you receive a memo and then you wanna give direction to form a subcommittee, you end up with an issue of having to bring it back to council. It, so it, your recommendation would be to keep it as a report if we, if there may be. If you're thinking the outcome might be that you approve a subcommittee with the information, then I would keep it as a report. Okay, so then that's why I, yeah, okay. That was my question. I, I'll keep it as a report, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing further questions on the board, um, so please sign up to speak if you would like to. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm good, thanks. Just kidding. Okay, so uh, really appreciate this conversation. Um, what strikes me is that uh, council spent and administration spent several years trying to reduce the amount of hours spent on committees. And uh, today, I think what we've discovered is that maybe that went too far. So I am in support of this motion. Um, I actually was never in support of the reductions uh, spiritually, although I did vote for them. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what that says, but um, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Councillor Knack. But, uh, one of the things that I think we should uh, be cognizant of in this conversation is that these committees really represent some of the like very strong values that Edmontonians hold and that council holds. And they really should be funded appropriately on all levels. Um, they are not on any level. And so this is a move in the right direction, in my opinion, and I look forward to future right moves. Uh, to support the, the services that Edmontonians really care about and the values that Edmontonians care about. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, I actually have a lot to say, and I'm going to start with talking to the committee members both in the meeting and that may be listening or hear, watch this afterwards. Uh, I know it's discouraging that you see that there is no subcommittee uh, motion as part of my motion right now. And some of the conversation around is ARC the best subcommittee to do? And so I just want to start by saying that please don't be discouraged. Uh, this is um, so important to council and we know it's so important to you that we just want to make sure if our resources are finite, which they are, that you are feeling like your time is going to have the biggest impact possible. And so it's coming from a place 
of compassion and care um, that we're looking we're looking at wanting to have that further conversation around that because if we are going to have to reallocate resources we need to make sure that that the value is there for what we achieve that being said i i really would encourage all my council colleagues to support the motion on the floor because i do think it is a conversation that that needs to happen around something that's so vital to our work and that we've all talked about our passion for transit and um, advancing public transit within our city. Um, and I just wanna take the last couple of minutes to just say how grateful I am to be the council appointed member on ETS advisory board. I know um, I, I had big shoes to fill with the former councillor that was on it uh, before me and is still very well loved on that committee. Uh, but they have welcomed me with open arms and the passion and the love for transit is, is apparent in, in every aspect of what you do. And you know, I think about the reports that you brought forward. You're one of the only committee committees that actually brought reports to Urban Planning Committee or any other committee for that matter. And that just shows the level, level of work and care. And the one that I found in reflecting on 2023, the most impactful was the one where you, you I think you were the most self-conscious as a committee about, which was the snow one. And you, you literally tracked your day-to-day -day experiences as users of transit in the winter of were the buses on time? Did you have trouble getting to the bus stop? Was the bus stop cleared? And I found it so impactful just hearing your stories um, and your experiences and motions came out of that. And so I think sometimes we can also get really bogged down in, in needing to have all the voices at the table and, and we do, we have, we have a machine in public transit in our transit department that does you know, corporate research that deals with both users and non-users and gets perception surveys and all of that primary data. You are here and your value is in the experiences and the day-to-day -day use of this transit system that you have and then being able to relay to us as we're making policy about whatever the topic is, be it bylaws for how we govern our public spaces, be it uh, snow, snow clearing, be it bus rapid transit, which we know is gonna be a big conversation coming forward that you can provide those experience about what will work, what won't work, what already is working and what is not working. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to debrief with any of you if you wanted to debrief after uh, today, just reach out to my office, I'm happy to, to chat. And then in my last minute, I just wanna take a few moments to specifically thank Giselle and Serena who are, have been on uh, ETS advisory board for years. They have given so much care, combat, passion, time, energy, thought into this uh, advisory com advisory committee. And you will be your 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 departure and no longer being on these committees will be absolutely missed. You're going to leave a big hole. Um, and I am so grateful that I got the opportunity to work alongside both of you and Emily and Mudasar, I'm very, very excited for the new energy that you will bring as the chair and vice chair of this committee going into 2024. And know I am here for you as is every one of my other colleagues, never feel that you can't reach out to any of us. I know they're also passionate about transit. We're here to support in any way we can. So thank you and uh, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, all right, let's vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Great, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And, and again, um, our gratitude to all the um, the members of the committee that joined us tonight, the the outgoing chairs, the incoming chairs, um, and thank you for for your dedication and commitment. And I do believe we have a subsequent that is just getting queued up. So I'm going to go to Councillor Rutherford for that one. Yeah. So my subsequent is just that administration provide a report 
outlining the current resources allocated to support council's advisory committees and options to provide an equi equitable allocation of resourcing to allow all committees to fulfill their mandate, inclu including possibility of a common budget and or shared resources. I'll second that. Uh, would you like to introduce Councillor Rutherford? Um, no, I'm happy to take any questions, but I think we've, yeah. we've parsed that out throughout the, the whole meeting, okay. why I'm bringing this forward. Great, so any questions? Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, just to the mover, I think this is excellent. And just want to make sure um, that I think this, this motion is really looking for a range of approaches. Uh, so potentially, again, centralizing some of that administrative support. So there's maybe one one person who's getting making sure the, the meetings are getting online properly. Is that uh, part of this conversation? I think I'm open to, similar to other um, things that we've done around various reviews, I think I'm open to a ver variety of options. Mm -hmm. um, I know that this is a gap currently, as we mentioned before, from, from some of the governance review because that specifically focuses on the city clerk, which would do a lot of those centralized functions. But volunteer engagement and management in and of itself is a big, big job and it's challenging when that's done off the side of someone's desk. Yeah, and I think that's really another piece that I think I'm understanding is, is it's ensuring that uh, it's not the side of someone's desk, it's for their full-time kind of thing and not, you know, subject matter experts would still be needed to, to tap into, but again, they would be um, involved to provide their expertise, not necessarily trying to fulfill a role of, with volunteer management or, or technical capacity um, that, that maybe, again, is not their core role. Or their core skill set. Uh, and, and that's not, you know, we want the people that are good at their, their expert areas of expertise to, to do that, to be able to dedicate their time to that. So yeah, exactly, you've got Perfect. it. Perfect, okay, well thank you so much. Thanks for putting that on. Great, I'm not seeing any further questions. Uh, so anyone to speak to this? Councillor Rutherford to close. No? <laughs> All right, uh, let's go ahead and vote. I am a yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Okay, good work, everyone. Uh, so that wraps up our agenda. Uh, so just to conclude here, uh, bylaws, we have none, private reports, none, motions pending, none, uh, notices of motion and motions without customary notice, um, none that I'm aware of, which means we are adjourned. Thank you so much for um, all of your participation today and, and thanks to administration.